Yeah, there's a good bit of hair coverage going around his ear there, like that. And what we have some moves. We so do have we some have... moves. We yeah. have uh, this event trick opening with the King's Pawn. What are we going to expect from Magnus Carlsen? Remember that Vasil Ivanchuk is in a must win situation. Magnus probably going to choose something very solid. Is he going to pick up the King's Pawn, play his personal favorite? Yeah, e5. It makes, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Again, we've got to think about the match situation. And uh, Magnus with the black pieces only needs to get a draw to go through. So there's no point him playing something incredibly sharp like the Sicilian. Um, he played e5 in nearly all the world championship matches that he's had uh, to defend his world championship title, which obviously he's now giving up. But he's got a lot of experience with e5. But talking about experience, no one has more experience than Ivanchuk. Ivanchuk is the veteran. He's been around. He's seen nearly ideas from many different generations. And uh, um, I, I can see here we're, we're heading straight into what looks like um, the main line Spanish. Um, so there's not really, again, a big surprise there. But um, what will we see later on? Well, they're both playing their moves very quickly. Magnus playing very traditionally, just putting his, the bishop in front of his king. And um, I wonder what line we get. Um, the main rule low pairs, rookie one on the board, and they're both moving quite quickly here, Ivanka. What do you reckon? Do we should we get a martial gambit? Do we think any chance of that? I don't think we will oh, because no, no, no. It's supposed to be because a draw, isn't it? Now, basically, exactly. I mean, it's such a forcing variation. It's very difficult to uh, prove an advantage. It's been so well worked out, and you also have to get try to get into Magnus's uh, head if you were Ivanchuk. Magnus has worked with lots of martial experts. I'm thinking of Jan Gustafsson and indeed no martial on the board because A2, A4 has been played. And uh, now it's Magnus's turn to think. Yeah, this is one of the main ways to avoid the martial. If we just go back um, and move there, um, the martial is if, if white goes for an ideal kind of setup with the move C3, where you, you want to build up with D4 and you want to be able to recapture with a pawn on d4, keeping two pawns in the center of the board. And if black plays quite slowly, then this can and should give white an advantage. So um, this gambit idea found, of course, by Marshall some years ago was d5. And you get many exchanges, just to show you. And in this kind of position, white does grab a pawn, but he can get attacked eventually with a bishop coming here. And you can look at White's queen side very badly developed. So it's so well analyzed, though, this that it, it tends to lead to a draw. So the anti marshal is this move a4. And uh, you try to play a little bit on the queen side here. And um, the threat is pawn takes pawn because of the pin on the that, that one. So rook b8. And I believe this is one of the main lines. Did we not see this being battled out in the world championship match uh, between? Uh, Nepo and Magnus Carlsen. I think it was this position mm. um, or very similar position where uh, Nepo, because B4 is a, is, a, is a main line there, but this was the, the move that Magnus was playing, where Magnus was taking this position. He's often, you think, getting very slightly worse positions against Nepo, but he was always comfortable drawing those positions. And that's all he needs to do today. We have another exchange. We can see on the cameras there, um, Chucky taking on B5. And this is, again, the normal way. And what's he played? What's he got up his sleeve? He's just playing C3, again, hinting at this move B4. And it could just be who's got the better preparation here. Um, this is a position they must have both expected, Yvanka. Yes, yeah, certainly. It's something that Ivanchuk has uh, expected, as you mentioned, Magnus, having played this position before. And a big question to Magnus, does he want to keep the position flexible and play D6? Or is he going to like lash out and try to force the matters with a D5 there? You've got that highlighted. Mm. Oh, yeah. This is uh, going to be interesting. And I especially love the World Cup formats because of that element of one side needing to win. And there we see Magnus thinking. He's contemplating. Yes, definitely. And uh, yeah, good point there, Ivanka. We're going to see we could get this kind of martial idea with B5. Where black has to give up a pawn but again that'll be a real test of preparation or the slower approach d6 but uh, i think we're now actually going to just pop over to the women's section is there another oh, i thought that was another uh, result i saw on the camera but not quite 
let's have a look because um, we have quite an interesting um, Berlin. Is that there, is there such a thing? Did did someone actually say we have an interesting Berlin? <laughs> is, that's an oxymoron if I've ever heard it. That's like exactly. saying an interesting accountant. Together. You know, it doesn't happen. <laughs> I'm going to meet an interesting accountant later, or I don't know, an exciting tax surveyor or whatever they are. I don't know. Um, okay. Or a boring chess player. There's no such thing. Okay, anyway, um, let's have a look uh, at the game here. And this is a Berlin. We are talking about the Berlin opening earlier. And do you know these plays well, Ivanka, um, Harika, and Alexandra? Yeah. I, uh, Harika is such a legend in her own right. And I actually played her for the second time last year at the Olympiad when she was heavily pregnant, like eight and a half months pregnant. And it wow. was a draw. But I, I still really rem uh, just admired her attitude, you know, that she just wanted to give everything for her country, even though she was expecting a baby. And when it comes to Harika, she's a very much a fighter. You really feel that when you're at the board, you feel that she's 100% focused. There is no like lack of concentration whatsoever from her. And you, you do feel like you have to be precise. And there we see Harika. Playing e4, e5, and uh, now we're seeing a Lopez. And as you mentioned, it is a Berlin from Goryashkina. And just to kind of update you, if no, for those people who didn't watch yesterday's round five game one, the two players did finish that game in a draw. So a draw would mean that these two move on to the tie breaks tomorrow. So there's a lot to play for, and yeah, we see the Berlin. So there's a number of ways you can play against this opening, and it's pretty much become very commonplace, this move here. I mean, it, it first get it started to get noticed in the year 2000, where Kramnik used it to beat Gary Kasparov in the World Championship uh, match. Uh, but recently, the likes of Alpha Zero um, have kind of favoured this move and proven uh, this, uh, this is a very good way to play for Black. And now white castles, we have the normal capture on e4 and d4, main move. The knight drops back and it was considered that uh, a long time ago, let's say before the uh, Kasparov, uh, Kasparov Kramnik match, that bishop takes c6 and pawn takes pawn and queen takes queen going for the Berlin ending was just supposed to be quite nice for white, but that's not so clear. Um, it's actually now considered very equalish. So white plays this move, and this is a bizarre line where it just looks like you're dropping a bishop, but when the bishop does drop, you play a4, you trap the knight back, and now d6, black realizing that that knight cannot be saved, so countering in the center, and now e6. I mean, it kind of looks like neither of these players can play chess, but this is all <laughs> very in-depth analysis. The pawns attacked, oh, I'll move it to another square where it can be taken, but what white wants to do is stop black opening the d file uh which black kind of wants to do here right black wants to open the d file and get a sort of symmetrical light position but this keeps it in a gambit style and now the bishop develops takes that one white captures the piece back so it is a pawn sacrifice white is a pawn down the knight moves into the center there logical space and we now have the current position i believe so um again it's very interesting these battles just to see how good the preparation is from both sides because this opening the berlin considered very solid is considered at top level to be a great way to get a draw right. um but uh this idea from harika is exciting um i don't know how many times it's been played before a very logical move now and white is gambiting a pawn against the berlin maybe getting ready for the F pawn to come running she up is. the board as well. Look, Most looks good, certainly. Right? I, I, and it's certainly the kind of move and the idea to put Koryashkina under pressure. Remember, if if Harika wins, she moves on to the semi finals. So that is going to look like an exciting game. And let's go back to the open section and let's take a look at the bird's eye view and have a look at these positions that are in play. Anything that catches your eye, Simon? Well, there's a lot of positions there. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have to quickly snap and oh, oh well, I, the Prague game. I like myself a bit of a French defence. Eric Geisy 
versus Grandilius. That looks that looks really funky. Um, Sarawana versus the Mingers. That looks like an English opening. I know reasonably well. But I would say, and we do want to have we do want to keep up with most of the games today. The Magnus Carlsen game is going to develop. It, we can see Magnus playing the quieter line. B6, Chucky going and building center up, B4. I suggest we actually go to the Eregaisi Grandilius game because this is um, a game where Black has to win. And it's a very, very tricky situation in these matches against an incredibly strong player to win with Black. So what strategy is um, Niels going to do? Niels lost the first game. So at the moment, Arjun with the white pieces only needs to... Uh, get a draw and it starts off with d4 d5 c4 e6 so the queen's gambit and um here <clears throat> we have knight c3 the normal move and now the triangle system and this is i i, I would have thought a great choice of openings ivanka right i mean uh, it's a very sharp opening this it is a very sharp opening and whenever i see that pawn structure now i think of that famous line that you came up with. <laughs> I can't even and remember you... what that was. <laughs> what, what did I come up with? Very it, solid. Can, you, can, can you repeat it? Yeah, I can repeat it. Oh, good. Nice uh, yeah. Shaped like a pyramid. It is. It is. It is <laughs> the pyramid setup, isn't it? It, it yeah. does. And and you yeah. follow that through with just a very solid uh, system. Just ask the aliens that built the pyramids. That's right. Anything pyramid related. Obviously, we've all watched those TV series. It's just the aliens, isn't it? Everything to do with the bloody aliens. They probably invented <laughs> chess as well, right? They invented everything. I think they, they invented my coffee that I, you know, every single blooming thing, blame it on the aliens. But this is, this is um, actually, I think, a very good choice from Niels because you get a sharp position. Uh, and the point being that Black's Bishop does look a bit silly, but it always does in this opening. But the point being that Black is actually often just trying to take this pawn and go b5. So if you play a normal developing move like knight to f3, having a pawn on c6 here really helps black because black can take on c4. And if white tries to win that pawn back in a simple way, look at this pawn on c6, it supports b5. And this is just the kind of position, if you need to win, that you really want to have, right, Ivanka? You know, That's you've got the perfect. extra pawn, it, it's unbalanced. It's it's imbalanced. I mean, you're going to see a situation where black has passed pawns and white also has passed pawns. It's a chaotic mix. And uh, also, Niels Grandelius is a fantastic calculator. That's very much up his street. But Arjun Eregaisi, he likes to fight, you know, so he, of course, is not going to go knight f3. Instead, he goes for the critical move, which is to play e4. And Niels has to do something in the center. So he has to take. And this is where things get spicy. And I'm just looking at Bishop B4. He, he didn't go uh, Bishop D2. He went no, Knight Bishop, C3. Yeah, this was actually, um, the well, you say that the main line, well, I think it's probably fair to say one of the main lines here is Bishop D2. But this became quite famous, this position, for, especially for the next move, Knight C3, when this was reached in another World Championship match involving Magnus Carlsen, and it was actually Vishwan Anand with the white pieces had this, uh, I think it was Anand white against Magnus. It could, no, I think Magnus had the white pieces here against Anand. And here Magnus Carlsen with white played this next move that we see Arjun play as well. Now the, the main line, uh, as uh, you have, have uh, I so, suppose the old main line is certainly Bishop D2. And this is the move that I've always played. Very interesting idea because black now wins a pawn. And you now take the bishop here. Black wins the piece back with check. And you get this crazy position here. Um, and you can see that white has quite nice compensation because of the dark squares, right? Uh, black can't castle immediately. There's ideas of the queen diving into that position there and maybe even castling queenside. This kind of thing goes on. But there's a lot of theory on this, Yvanka. This is so, so heavily analyzed. and. Um, I think on a normal day, Arjun might well have gone for this, but in a in the situation where he needs a draw, it kind of makes sense to avoid sacrificing a pawn, right, and playing knight c3. Yeah. Knight c3 also, for, well, as you mentioned, it is a variation, but one thing that I would take heart from is that, okay, 
like can simply develop normally and talking about normally he actually played e5 i was looking at knight f6 and yeah i mean i think my favorite pawn structure was c6 and e6 but yeah i mean i think if black does this black's supposed to be quite a lot worse isn't he i mean just only because there's like really annoying bishop g5s in these positions and you you Mm -hmm. have to like it's really hard to break the pin um i I mean i think that before yuvanka um magnus uh, in the game where Magnus versus Anand, C5 was played um, quite quickly. So it was one of your breaks you mentioned, I think, that that kind of idea. Um, but E5 is really interesting, right? Because, uh, I, I, you know, this is really unbalancing the position. And I think Arjun's strategy here is not to take that one. I mean, it, it, you know, and, and unbalance the position as much as he can. He wants to keep it under control because Black's now offering a pawn sacrifice self. I mean, you could take that one. I've no idea what's happening. If you grab it, I guess Black's going to take on uh, to take the queens off and try to get compensation somehow. Very interesting. Maybe also Queen A5. Let's just get up to date with the game. Bishop E3, trying to hold the center together. And now uh, we see Neil's capture. And very straightforward strategy. White only needs a draw. Let's get the queens off the board. And now Neil's does exchange queens. Develops his knight. And Arjun Castle's queen side. Interesting. Black develops and knight to f3. And what do you think about this one, Yvanka? This is the current position so far. Um, well, okay. The pause is because I, I want to be honest. And perhaps I shouldn't be as honest as I'm thinking. I'm thinking that the position is there's no tension in the middle of the board with pawns, which does mean that there is a danger that Neil's position could simply just fizzle out into something very, very simple, very brawn. And remember, Grand Elias is in a must-win situation, so I'm not entirely happy with what's happened. It's always a bit annoying getting the queens off the board, isn't it? I mean, you've mm. got to win the game and the queens come off, and it's like, okay, goodbye, my most annoying piece on the board. And generally when the queens come off, the the percentages of a draw uh, just just really go up by quite a long way don't they Ivanka so uh, I, I I kind of agree with you that um there is an argument that way it's more likely to be a draw it's a symmetrical pawn structure again another factor that could head towards a draw I suppose the good side is that black must have kind of equalized here black doesn't really have any problems there is opposite side casting I don't know if that means a great deal um but still still play there at least you know it's not yeah. over as yet No, this is still very much early days and never underestimate the power of a human to go wrong. That's what I've learned in life, especially in my games. Oh, especially not your games. I mean, uh, you you all seem to do pretty well against me. Um, We should go more wrong when you play me. Maybe try that a bit harder next time, please. Yeah. Oh, I've gone um, plenty wrong against you, Simon. You just don't remember those games. Because <laughs> no, they've been so clinical and so easy. And, oh, I'm not uh, sure about that. Yeah. And uh, let's uh, let's have a look at some other games. So let's uh, bring up the bird's eye view once again and have a look at the positions that are on the table. Yeah. So that was quite an interesting opening we had there. And... Um, there's lots of must-win scenarios going on. I mean, just an update on the Magnus Carlsen game. Uh, not too much has changed there. We'll come back to that one later on, but that position, it has developed a bit, but it's um, still uh, pretty pretty standard stuff there. So, Yvanka, you, you pick a game now, um, and yeah. we'll go and have a look. It'd be nice to okay. cover as many as we can. We definitely will cover as many as we can. And the ones that I'm really, really interested in is all those people who are in a must win situation and someone who perhaps is a bit of a dark horse is uh, Nijat Abbasov. He won yesterday against Salem Saleh and uh, Salem Saleh is actually the first Emirati to have reached this stage in a World Cup. So I wouldn't mind looking at this game just to kind of check out the whole scenario. It looks quite tense, a lot of pieces on the board. Yeah, we'll pick it up just from the start. And um, you're right, um, this is this is a game where white must win. Um, but of course, Salam has the white pieces. And I, I suppose uh, Abbasov's been one of the surprises of, of the competition so far. 
um, maybe a long, you know, th this is a match where, you know, let's be honest, that both of the players are kind of underdogs compared to the other big names we can see like Nepo, Vidic, just on rating, they got the lower ratings. So when they saw the pairing of Anka, they must have been, when they knew about the pairing, they must have been quite happy. It's like, right, I'm playing someone on paper similar to me. I can get another chunk of money. I can get a little bit nearer to that candidate's place. Uh, and, you know, by avoiding the big superstars. And, well, as you say, we'll have a look how the opening has gone. And it seems to have just started quite slowly for White. White playing the King's Indian attack. And we now have Black playing in quite a traditional way. Black just building up the center. And basically, we've got, we got after the next two moves, the King's Indian defense, but with White having an extra tempo. And just so. Uh, in case you don't know what the King's Indian defense is at home, it's an opening that Black plays against d4. And the King's Indian defense, as we're going to see, starts generally with these moves here. And you can see this is an opening that Kasparov, Bobby Fischer, players like that used to used to favor. And White's doing it with an extra tempo here, Ivanka. I mean, what are your feelings about that? I, I think it's a, a really good choice by Sanem. And uh, incidentally, when it comes to Abasov, of course, you know, he's the local hero. He has beaten quite a few notable players. You know, he's beaten Frezene, beaten Giri, beat Svidler in tie breaks, and now playing Salem. Salem, I, I think Salem has had a bit more of a steady kind of road to where he is now. Like he's, he beat um, some just Daneshwar from India and Daniel Vokaturo from Italy, amongst others and uh, there i'm seeing in the chat king's indian attack poggies i do think it's a good idea you know the, the position is tense and you can play for a win and if you're very familiar with this type of pawn structure why not play it with that tempo extra is this supposed to be poggies or poggers i, I i'm i'm such I a noob when it comes to pog chat, oh, don't don't um, question me on this type of. Oh no! I, I, I was hoping anything. you were going to help me out, help no. this old man out here. Is it no. poggers or poggies or or pog, pogger or or pog I, or, or porkies? I don't know. What is it? Porky, What's going on? Porkies, porkies, Simon. Let's come up with our own. <laughs> but porkies. porkies does mean lies. Wasn't that a classic <laughs> film from an era, I believe? Um, but I don't know. I, I expect the chat can educate us. Both for okay. All right. Thank you. Poggers. Uh, it's okay, also good. an emote. That, that K-E-K-W, I don't know what it stands for, but a, I think it, grip, it means Simon. laughing. Get a grip, Simon. <laughs> 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 Love it. Love the chat. Love you all. <laughs> and, um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I think it is a good, cho a good choice um, from the, the white side because um, it's a very – exciting opening and um salem's you know one of his uh, strengths is tactical attacking play and with this kind of structure you're going to avoid exchanges you're going to keep the pieces on the board and he goes now for a traditional idea of playing e4 which is um the normal idea queen e1 looks like quite a peculiar move but it means that when you play e4 if there's an exchange on that square you keep the queens on the board so it's not a bad move and now black continues developing and we see that Black goes straight into, I, I would have thought, the kind of setup that basically White wants. White, when you play the Kings in defense, and I know this because I play the Kings in defense as well, wants this closing of the center. It's kind of like Lego, you know, you lock the pieces, you lock the pieces in place so they're stuck. And that means both sides have their own plans. And White's plan will now be to attack on the King side with F4. And Black's plan is generally to play c4. It's quite a closed position, Yuvanka. A couple more moves. White now securing this square on c4 for his knight. So stopping b5, normal idea. Black castles. The knight comes towards that square. Rook e8. And you can see that knight may well just poke in there. I actually, uh, I actually quite like uh, this position for White. I mean, uh, I, I, I'm a bit biased because I like the Kings in defense. Black is doing absolutely fine. but. Generally, White's idea will be develop that knight, get this knight out of the way, probably, and play f4 with, with some initiative. What are, what are you thinking about this position? I mean, uh, I, I expect you you play this on the black side, this kind of structure, right? Do you, Vanka, or um, not really? No, I've, I've, never, I've never touched the King's Indian attack or defense. I, and 
like you, I'm very, very hesitant about pushing that deep pawn one square forward because as you've mm. mentioned, you know, play then becomes very determined. You know, white has a very straightforward plan, put the knight on c4, move the knight back, prepare f4, you know, and then go for that sack, push those pawns forwards and then sack something and then check mate. And this is a really difficult plan to face off against. I know com computers love it for the person who's pushed the deep pawn because ultimately they're fantastic defenders, but the human element for me is just, it's just too terrifying. So I, I like what uh, Salem has done. I think it's been a very smart choice. And this game is going to be full of fireworks. I can predict that. Yeah, 100% agree. I mean, let, let's just say in this position, just to demonstrate what we think White's plan can be, let's say you put the knight there. That's what White's been aiming for. Black tries to keep his bishop. Like, let's say drops back. And now you play knight h4. This would be a very common follow-up idea because you want to play f4 and you want to try to attack on uh, the king's side. Now, you have to be a little bit, this move here from black might be very crafty because in the long run, this is really the main and you could say only idea that white has to play f4. And when that happens, you could have an exchange on f4 and some tactics like the knight b5, for example. So let's just say black continues in normal way. Black, as I mentioned, wants to try and play c4. How on earth do you play c4 here? You want to play b5, get rid of the knight, then play c4. Um, so if you play a6 first, a bit of a mistake, I can play a5. So this is normal. And then you get this kind of thing. Maybe I can still play f4. And this is this is what could um, occur. Uh, and I'm wondering if we get this position, does this rook really help black? Let's say you take here. I generally want to take with a pawn. Maybe not the only move, but let's just say I do. Because now these pawns are very mobile. You can see... The queen could even come out here. Is a move like this something to worry about? I don't think it is, Yvanka. I don't think I don't think if I was white, I'd be worrying about this pin. It doesn't seem to do anything at all. You've got to watch out for it. It doesn't really seem to help black. And I imagine if white gets this kind of position in a must-win situation, he'd be very happy. I think he would be very, very happy singing from the roofs. I think the king could just lie to h1. I mean, there's so many plans. And like you mentioned, it's all to do with those mobility of the pawns. And I also just wanted to highlight one other typical attacking motif. If black doesn't capture on f4, then white will just simply play f4, f5, follow that up with g4 at the right time when it's supported, and then just keep pushing those pawns forward to break through. Yes, those pawns will come straight up the board and push black around. So uh, so this is, I think, a very interesting opening choice, actually, in a must-win situation, avoiding a lot of theory. The computer obviously, well, I say obviously, it, it thinks black's okay. The computer really likes space. It doesn't trust these openings. It doesn't trust the King's Indian defense. It's maybe one of the only openings the computer kind of underestimates a little bit. Um, I think it's fair to say, especially in human terms, because the attack counts for a lot more in human games where errors are more likely. But let's see if there's any other action we can bring up. Uh, we'll come back to this game, the bird's eye view, and um, just have a look. Maybe we'll pop back to Magnus's game very quickly. Should we do that just to yeah. um, find out what's happened there? Then we'll, we'll have a look at some other games. because Definitely. Because there are a, a few Magnus, players. It, definitely. Yeah. Everyone loves Magnus. So let's have a quick check-in. And also, I also want to check in, uh, in on their Indian prodigies. Gukash, 17 years old, 2760 on the live ratings and 2760 plus. I'm not being entirely accurate there. And of course, Pragnanda still in the mix. And uh, how did the game between Ivanchuk and Carlson develop? Because we left them at C3 and I, I'm seeing that the live board is something completely different. There's been some progress. That has, yeah. That's why I just wanted to update it. And I think we, yeah, as you say, must go and look at the Prague game, uh, also some of these other games which are going on. But in this position, there are these two choices. Do you play this delayed marshal or do you just keep it more solid? Magnus only needs a draw. So, yeah, the uh, Magnus playing sort of very, he's playing his proper openings in this game. I think this is showing great respect to Ivanchuk because this is what he played in the World Championships. He does, you know, mess around with other openings a lot, but it shows the respect he's got for Ivanchuk. Ivanchuk taking over the center, and now white has to face this one. Are these pawns weak or strong? Black's trying to say they're a little bit of a target, but 
they are well defended at the moment. Black now pushes in the center, d5. This pawn has to decide what to do. Pushing forwards, attacking the knight seems very natural. Now, the knight comes in. When you've got less space, as black does, because of this pawn, you want to initiate exchanges. So by coming here, you're probably going to swap this knight off, as you can now do. So you make your position a little bit easier to play as you made more exchanges. And there you go, more pieces get exchanged. And now this bishop finds a comfortable square, a good diagonal. And h3, maybe hinting at g4. Let's remember, white does need to win. The queen comes out. And here we are, Ivanka. What do we think? Do we like white's winning chances here? A bit early to say, but the opening is important. The opening is important, and uh, the first thing that I'm drawn to, of course, is the pawn structure. When there's a pawn on e5, I have this general rule. Remember, general rules can be broken, and it's just all about look at where they point to. They point to the king side, and that is the flag that tells you you should be attacking on the king side. So moves that I will be looking at is, is it possible for white to generate a king side attack? And that's actually going to be very difficult with this bishop well placed on f5. So there's not going to be any pawn storming going on. So then we kind of have to adopt a bit more positional approach. And you're like thinking, well, the pawn on e5 does cut the board in two. But what next? I mean, are you, is white simply going to go bishop f4, rook a6, and just pile up on the a line and just say, space is everything, my friend. And yeah, it's an interesting what position, is Black's isn't it? Yeah. What is Black's plan as well in reverse as well? I mean, I, I will, is Black looking at playing F6 or is Black simply looking at following that old motto when you don't have too much space, swap off those pieces? Yeah, maybe maybe the bishop can come in here at some point. I don't think that will happen. But it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, to my eyes, this looks like, you know, from, from a position you're playing the world champion, uh, how do you beat the world champion? Or not the world champion, but, you know, he's, he's kind of like, He's, he's a great player. Let's, I always make that mistake, don't I? He's not the world champion. <laughs> Sorry, he's Ding. Not the world champion. I love you, Ding. Really, yeah. <laughs> I do. But he's kind of like yeah. he's kind of like was the world champion. He's playing the highest rate player. I think I've got that right in the world. And um, how do you beat him with the, with the white pieces? And I, I think the way to do it, Ivanka, is try to attack. Right, try to get a position where you keep pieces on the board. Don't take him into an ending. Because Magnus can defend so, so well. Just keep it dynamic. And he's got that, right? He's got a dynamic pawn structure. Having this pawn on e5 will always give you chances. I mean, the move g4, I see some people in the chat have actually sort of uh, uh, suggested this move. I don't like that here because it doesn't really achieve much. And it might weaken your king. Yeah, you don't want to throw this up. This is a much more sensible move. Unless you can play like f4, f5. This would be ideal. So if you could ever move the knight and then go f4, g4, f5, oh, that would be the dream situation. Just imagine this pawn getting there and this pawn getting there. I mean, that, that would be, like, really pleasant if he can get that. That's, that's what I'd be thinking as one idea, maybe, Ivanka, as well here. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that too. But I, if I were white, I would have that idea in the back of my pocket. It's there, it's available. But first, I feel that... White has to start targeting maybe the pawn on b5. Um, because, say, black, but you know, I'm just thinking about lines like where black perhaps goes rook a8, trying to initiate their set of trades and trying to get a knight from eight to a5 and to c4, mm -hmm. them squares, you know. And what I am looking at, you know, is to kind of counter that, you have to kind of make moves like queen e2. Yeah, I like your queen e2. Maybe put, Very clever. Kind of put some pressure, and then you know when the when you've kind of resolved any activity that Black has, then you can go G four F four. Well, you've got to prepare that. Sure, right? I like your idea, Ivanka. Yeah, I, I, mean, I think you've done something really clever there, and this is something that I, I get a bit carried away. You can see I'm like, yeah, checkmate, buddy. I'm coming for you. I don't care about anything else. I'm just going for your king. I see Eddie the e pawn is right up the board. I want to join some brothers next to him, charging down. But I'm not looking at Black's counterplay. What is Black trying to do? And as you noted, this idea of Black getting the knight here and into here would really help Black's position. He can't do that now as the a5 square is under White's control. But maybe this idea of rook a8 would help Black 
offer to exchanges, but also, you know, try to do this plan. So Queenie too, I like it. Very nice move. The point being, you try to tie this pawn down. Uh, maybe you could have done yeah. that last move though, if you wanted to play it and maybe take your time. I mean, I'm no. just definitely, I mean, this is a kind of position where Magnus can't just sit there. He can't make some moves like H6. He has to come up with a plan. And Rook A8 was one plan I thought about. Another mm -hmm. idea that I'm currently considering is to go in B4, you know? Yeah. The rook and the b pawn are lined up together why not try to activate one of them and again keep saying to chucky you want to play well let's see how far you're uh you want to go yeah i mean i i the idea b4 is the kind of move that i think black wants to play but i'd be very careful playing it here because maybe now white meets it with c4 right and you might give white right. the opportunity possibly to get rid of this like you know if you get if you ever get this kind of exchange i've got now another mobile pawn in the center. So it might be all right, but it, it, it's like, has to be timed very carefully, doesn't it, B4, I think. Um, yeah, it certainly does. Yeah. But he can't, well, one thing though, he can't just wait. He has to either prepare B4 or kind of try to get that knight yeah. on C6, because the knight yeah. on C6 is not good. Yeah, I mean, I love your idea, Yvanka, just going Rook A8, you know? I mean, the other, the other thing you can think about doing these positions is put the knight on E6, that, that can be okay, but also, the long-term plan of these white pawns coming up, the knight on e6 could, could be an issue there. Um, so I, I think if I was Magnus in, in, the, in the match situation where an ending, good, draw, good, I, I would go for your rook a8 and original knight a5 plan. I, I really like that idea. But it is early days. Um, Ivanchuk just playing a very simple developing move with his last move. Can't be a bad move. We'll come back to this one. There's lots of other games to catch up on. This is going to get really exciting. Uh, later on, there's no doubt about that in their mind. Only one pair of knights have been exchanged, and Ivanchuk. I hope he gets attacking. I want to see Ivanchuk throw some things at Magnus's king. Don't you? Come on, I... kill the king, kill the king. I, I, well, also he's in his element in these uh, really aggressive, dynamic positions. So I want to see that as well. And of course, I mean, I saw a lot of comments there in the chat saying that he is the people's champ, and Chucky, it would be an absolute fairy tale if he managed to make it to the next round. Well, unless you're Magnus and, Carlsen, uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but even then, I think that Magnus would kind of applaud him and say, fair play. He would. And yeah. let's, let's go back to the bird's eye view and let's have a quick look at how some of our Indian prodigies are doing. I mean, it's just incredible. Actually, we have four players from India in this uh, at the stage we have uh pragnananda erigaisi gukesh and vidit yeah i mean one, one thing is clear the future and the current situation of chess is so bright uh for india uh it, it's incredible how many strong players um you know around similar age have just come through and are performing so well um i i don't know what the secret formula is but they are, they are, you know, overperforming on a constant, constant basis. So I think we should have a look. I mean, we had a, a little look at Eragaisi's game earlier. Um, should, should we check out Pragnananda yeah, against Burkes? Because uh, that looked to me like it was an advanced French. Yes, it was. Yeah, I think so. And when I was playing the advanced, advanced French. French? What, what did you call it there? <laughs> I, 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 the advanced fresh. <laughs> fresh. I like it. Fresh. Oh, yeah, baby. Let's keep it fresh with the advanced fresh. I'm going to do you down with the advanced fresh. Freshen you up. <laughs> I think that's much better. I think we should call it keep it fresh with the advanced fresh. Love it. <laughs> Can we see, see you do your the advanced. The advanced fresh? fresh uh, okay. I love how you rescue my <laughs> my errors. Thank oh, you, Simon. No. And anyway, <laughs> when I was playing all those years ago, I never really liked it when Black just got that knight on C4. And I'm just looking at this, you know, Burkesh has gotten a knight to a beautiful outpost. Yeah, certainly. I mean, what's what that's happening there? Well, let's have a look because you played the advance fresh uh, as white or black. Um, which, which side? As white. Aha. Uh -huh. As white, and I always lost to you, Simon, except once where uh -huh. I was playing for my I am norm, and then uh, and, and I and I threw the game because I liked you so much. No, 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 no! You found this amazing stalemate, and I was like, uh, I kill you, Simon. Did you not get your? You did that? you not get your I am? No, I didn't. 
you didn't get your iron. Did I ruin? I ruined your your I am title chances. Yeah. Did you always hate? It was okay. Did you always hate me after that? No. Only for a little bit, like an hour. Only during only during the game when I saw that stalemate trick and I was like yeah, Simon. That was dirty. I was a dirty but... player. Um, and going back to the opening, yeah, I mean this this you know the advanced French is I played it from the black side and e five indicates against the French defense that white wants to play the advanced variation and black must now start by attacking this square this is so key because when you are cramped you need to you know try to use some dynamic things to create chances and the di first dynamic thing you do is attack b4 so you can't really play this variation without c5 you can't allow these pawns to remain there so white now gets his pawn chain and tries to keep his pawn chain control black develops again attacking d4 white now brings his knight out defending and then we have the old traditional move with the queen adding more pressure to uh, d4 and this is again the, the main line uh, a3 with the idea of playing b4 getting space over there and i think in this situation i mean the, the new line is actually there's some very interesting stuff where white sacrifices a pawn with bishop d3 that's the trendy stuff, but we won't go there. This is all still theory. Black developing, trying to get the C file ready. And white gaining that space. This has all been seen loads of times before. And now rook C8, you can see. We have to show the trick. There is we a have trick to show the trick. Yep. There is a trick, Simon. Put it on the board. Yep. If uh, white develops the light square bishop, I, I know this because I fell for it. Maybe once. Oh, what? Well, yeah. That, I was like, Am I gonna... yeah, if you put the bishop on e2, yeah. then you can I think Ooh. you can just simply go knight takes pawn, right? Oh, okay. And then after, boom. yeah, boom. And then after knight takes knight, rook takes bishop. Okay. And that gives you, that gives you like loads of loads compensation. Because you're going to win another pawn in the center. Yeah. And you get loads of compensation. Okay. That, that, that's, uh, that's a very interesting line. And I suppose another trick that white must be, you know, a, a very normal plan in these positions is to play knight c3, where you want to go knight a4 and attack the queen uh, this way, um, because your knight wants to hit the queen and come and sit in there. But of course, you now have to consider mainly a move like this, which looks, I don't know why the computer thinks white is okay, because that looks pretty scary for me. But of course, they didn't play that. Let's uh, again, just keep up with the, the moves. Bishop b2, this is still all theory. This is theory. I, I remember this theory, Ivanka, from like 25 years ago. You know, this is this bishop b2 used to be one of the main lines. The other main line was bishop e3. And against this move, okay, black now has to develop these kingside pieces at some point. So the knight, where do you want to put the knight? Well, you want to put it on f5 because you still want to keep this pressure on b4. White now brings the knight out because it's defended by the bishop. And this is still theory from like 25 years ago, knight a5. And I remember this move being recommended literally about 25 moves ago. It looks really flash, but the idea is to simply use the pin on the b-pawn. Let's see what how Prag plays. He plays bishop d3, just continuing developing. The knight hops in, and now he just moves the bishop back, Yvanka. Bishop c1. Black hits the queen side and he now castles. This is getting very interesting. Black now potentially winning a pawn there. I mean, this is this is uh, this is interesting stuff, right? This position, Ivanka. Might be just very good preparation. I'm gonna say by Prag, because I've seen him do these kind of pawn sacrifices before. He has incredible uh team of helpers behind him. And you know, um Burks might be because he probably hasn't played as much as Prague, a little bit more rusty. So it could be great preparation, right? Yeah. It certainly looks like preparation on uh, just using the clock times just to support this. And I agree with you. It is it is really interesting because back in 25 years ago, I was playing B5 with white. And now the theory has just moved on, like you just sacrifice material, rook B1. The plan is just simply go pawn takes pawn and uh, then use the extra space. Remember, Black's position is very cramped. And I also just wanted to point out one thing that is massively in White's favor. Take a look at that light square bishop. It's on d3. When you have a pawn on e5, that bishop wants to be on this square. And normally, 
this doesn't happen in the French at all. You know, like it either gets loads and loads of compensation or simply will harass that bishop. So this just basically means that if Black is careless and just castles the king to G8 at some later point, he always has to be careful of some kind of Greek gift ideas. Yeah. I mean, as a long-term French defence player, Ivan I mean, uh, these kind of uh, positions... <sighs> I, the reason I don't always play the French as black is because I hate my king. It's like, do you not want to get safe, black king? Are you happy being so lazy in the middle? What is wrong with you? Can't, can't you just get yourself tucked away where I don't have to worry about you anymore? He's like a petulant child, you know, running, you know, keeping in the centre when he should be tucked up in bed. Go to bed, king. And this is why I don't like it. I mean, look at White's king. White's king is so safe. But how does the black king ever get safe? And it's not going to be happy staying there because it gets in the way of the coordination of black's pieces. So I, I, you know, this is why I kind of went off the French. I mean, yeah, black does have some compensation, I believe, or on the queen side here. But in the long run, it's like, where do you put your most precious piece? And that's, that's the danger that black is in here. And let's remember if Prague wins this game, he goes through. Um, but, you know, uh, there's a long way to go. Um, I just don't like that black king, you think? Yeah, there's a lot of danger here for black in this position. Well, we will see how this game develops. Remember, if someone wins this one, it means they're going through to the next stage. This is round five, game two. So much at stake here. And 45 minutes in, this is the perfect time for us to take a break. And we will leave you with these beautiful shots of the playing hall. And when we return, you don't want to go anywhere because you don't want to miss all the action that's going to be happening today. We will catch up on more of the games and more of the action. See you in a few minutes. Chess.com's game review recently got a major update. Here are four key notes. At the end of each game review, you will now see a summary of the game from your coach, your performance rating for that game, and a quick grade for you and your opponent in the opening, middle game, and end game. We've added a new classification called Miss for when a move fails to take advantage of an opportunity, but it is otherwise a sound move. We've also changed the definition of blunder. Now a move will only be considered a blunder if it loses material or allows a checkmate. Coach will now draw arrows and highlight squares when you hover over or click on the highlighted words in the move explanation. This should make move explanations easier to follow. Finally, Coach's explanations will now reference specific pieces and threats in the explanations, making move explanations much more intuitive. The new game review experience is available on chess.com right now. This August, engage in a battle of epic proportions against some of the most bodacious artists history hath ever seen. Behold, Raphael, the Prince of Painters, doth seek a fresh apprentice. Dost thou possess the prowess to impress him? Michelangelo, a true Renaissance man, painter, sculptor, architect, and poet, doth possess a myriad of artistic talents. Yet one wonders, can his creative genius translate to brilliance upon the board of chess? Prepare thyself for a game as dramatic as the Baroque paintings of Artemisia Gentileschi, one of the most expressive artists of the 1600s. Our renowned sculptor, Donatello stands tall as one of the most important artists of the early Renaissance. His unique blend of creativity, aesthetics, adaptability, and patience maketh him a challenging foe. Lo, Leonardo da Vinci, known for his artistic talents, scientific curiosity, and innovative ideas, is the very embodiment of the Renaissance. He is not only among the greatest artists to ever live, but also one of the greatest thinkers. May fortune smile upon thee. Create thy masterpiece on chess.com. Cowabunga!
and uh, we are back for all the action on round five, game two, there in the Baku playing hall. And there we can see the women's quarterfinal in play. Eight women remaining in the competition. So many names originally beginning, and we have to kind of also just let, take a look at this, Simon, because I just can't get over it. These are huge names. These, you know, we have former women's world champions and they've been knocked out. We also have the current women's world champion. Ju Wenjun knocked out in round four. Alexandra Goreshkina still remaining in the competition. Katarina Wagner, Nana Sagnitsa, and Ibisara Asalbieva, women's blitz world champion. I mean, I could just go on and on. You know, Alexandra Kostanik, former women's world champion. And we also have Maria Muzichuk. But someone who's still remaining in the competition, but not here on this graphic, is 20-year-old Bulgarian international master Salimova. Mugil <coughs> Thamsh Salimova, she's a massive talent. And uh, she, yesterday, won her game against Paulina Shevrolova. And that puts her in a very comfortable situation, where there is still pressure. Yeah, I mean, uh, she... Uh... Did she also knock out Kostenyuk, or am I getting that wrong? No, um, th that was uh, Theodora Injak. Okay, who knocked right, out yeah. Kostenyuk. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I mean, but I, I think because a lot of the favourites are kind of gone in this competition, uh, and there's only let's just remind everyone eight players left now in, in the women's section, um, and you know you must be suddenly thinking, hang on, I've got a chance, right? You're down to the last eight, and you come this far already. You, you see that some of the bigger seeds, some of the bigger seeds, like the Women's World Champion, has left the competition. You think, well, I don't have to play her anymore. And you're like, there's a chance here. I can actually get into the candidates and become World Champion. And it's like, wow, you, you can see that dream is like, you know, getting closer and closer. And that, that might, you know, give you that extra confidence. Um, I think we should look at that game you, you mentioned. <coughs> we should look at the game between Shovilova and, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a bit of a cough there. Uh, and this one, but I'm, and I'm just, but I'm, I'm looking at the position here. And Black only needs a draw. Is that right in this game? Black only needs a draw. And taking a look at that, just uh, going through the opening moves, we can see it was an Italian. Well, no, yeah, no, I hang mean, on a second. Knight came to c3. Yeah. I was misreading that one. Yeah. And Lena plays this Knight c3 move. And uh, this, this move is. Uh, um, well, it often indicates the Vienna. So black plays the main move, knight f6. And, uh, n you know, in, in previous lifetime, f4 used to be played very regularly here. But then d5 uh, was found out to be a very good response by black. And black has no problems whatsoever in this position. But, but quite recently, um, white has been surprising the player of the black pieces with this bishop c4 move. This has been popping up time and time again, you anchor, actually. I mean, I, I think maybe even Naughty Bet used it to defeat um, Aronian very quickly. And um, we maybe commentated a game in round one where it was used. And here, it's a great way to trick uh, a player because here, Black, Black's main move is to go knight takes e4. You know, this is, this is a big line. And this gets really complex now after queen h5. And now knight d6, where you get this kind of uh, a complex situation. But I, I kind of feel after bishop c4 that black already goes wrong here. I don't know the theory, but c6 in this position might be the right idea because you're trying to go d5, but it's white to move first. And white now breaks in the center with d4. And after an exchange on d4, this queen looks quite safe because black would like to play knight c6, but you can't because there's a pawn there. b5, I don't know, there's something a bit strange about this. The bishop remains on the f7 pawn, and black is also dropped into a big thing, Ivanka. My first impression of this position is it's pretty disgusting for black because if I was white here, I'd be like, I've got three pieces developed. I've got e5 maybe as a threat. I can develop so easily. My bishop can pin. I can castle queenside. I might even bring my knight to g5. Or am I being a bit optimistic? There is there is c5, c4. Maybe that is that possibly 
what yeah Max hang on a second in? so so yeah. there are some ideas like that so first of all let's have a look at uh, c5 c5 c4 was it the noah's ark trap right yeah trying to just trap the bishop here this happens but in some lines of rollo pairs and uh why is it called noah's ark do we think i have I no know. idea probably because it's as old a time as i don't know i heard that I really noah don't... actually played it against a giraffe and uh on the ark and, the giraffe and that lost one. game and the draft won. Yeah, he won the piece by sticking <laughs> sticking his neck out there with the pawn. That's that's the story behind it. I'm sticking to it. But I, I guess I guess White just plays Luke. Queen E five check, right? Right. So and, yeah, and, and then that check is super important because all White all Black has done is actually conceded a massive square on D five. So let's uh, yeah. wind our necks back in. Like a giraffe would, like it, clever. Exactly. Why not exactly. Noah's Ark neck in? Let's do it. Uh, I mean, this is still quite interesting because Bishop E7, I'm still threatening to win a P. I mean, I don't really, and I'm threatening to gain, now I've got this square for my knight, it, it kind yeah. of looks quite interesting to me. But I guess it's interesting, but I guess you go Bishop D5, right? You just stick yeah. that piece on D5 and then put that into the middle. And that does look really nice to white, I agree. Okay, let's wind let's wind the draft's neck back in. But what what else do you play if you're not D6. playing C? Sorry, D six. Okay, also, then... because uh, as black, I'm also Friend. super terrified of E five. You know, well, well, let's uh, play. That's let's, kind let's, of you're going to play E five. Okay, let's, let's, let's uh, game let's on. And now, uh, now, now, if I didn't have the computer running, the key move is keep this one. Hang on a minute, boys and girls. Can't I take on F seven? Whoa. This is getting yeah. really sharp, yeah? Take on f7, again, let's go into I it. I mean, I'm grabbing that one because if you take my bishop, I'm going to wing your queen and you don't have a counter check with your bishop here. So you've got to play king f7 and, you know, really? I mean, the computer thinks this is okay for black, but really? the computer is bonkers. Maybe it is. Yeah, but maybe, maybe you're maybe. okay. I don't know. But don't did really, you have, uh, well, I have, to, sometimes my, my brain's a bit slow. Let's just count the material. So, okay, you're, material you're, is even. You're lucky, you think, because if it's just sometimes, that's okay. But if you're like me and it's always <laughs> a little bit slow, that's when you have problems. But my yeah. mouth um, makes up for it by talking rubbish. <laughs> So my brain's slow, but my mouth is quick. I, it's good to hear that because Thank sometimes you. my mouth is just like going on and on and on, and my brain like catches up and is going, "Where's where are you going with all this?" I get that all the time. I okay. never even know where I'm going. But I don't know. This position is crazy, right? I mean, let's just go back. Your d6 move. It, it it looks very interesting because you are threatening c5 and you're threatening c4, and I, I kind of like this e5 move. I mean, maybe after this one other options maybe i don't even take there which kind of feels crazy right it kind of feels it crazy feels like but maybe, maybe i want right? to maybe i want to take there with a knight yeah maybe i go queen takes queen and just bring my knight up and that's, that's awfully sophisticated simon well that's but my like middle it. name simon sophisticated williams that's what <laughs> i used to get called in uh, infant school by the two-year-olds <laughs> even though they can pronounce sophistication even if they tried <laughs> okay um it looks it, it looks kind of interesting right though it looks interesting yeah, yeah definitely it looks interesting it certainly looks like things are going wrong and and just yeah. just wanted to check one line out which is sure after e5 could black get feisty and play c5 first look. so d6 e5 c5 wow yeah, yeah oh suddenly there's too much Wow. After C, I was kind of hoping for C four, but I, no. Now yeah. it's on the board. You do, you're doing the it's draft. It's not as good as it looked like in my head. So that's. <laughs> <laughs> I get that when I order sometimes at restaurants. You know, I have the steak and chips, please. And oh no, I didn't want that. Thank you. That ain't no steak. <laughs> um, I um, yeah, I don't know. But what, what does white play? It doesn't look as bad as the computer says. It's really weird because, I mean, even here, you know, C4 is threatening to win a piece. I guess I just play some move. Like move you go queen, queen E3. Like, queen, get, queen E3 looks maybe really Maybe Queen normal. E3. <laughs> the evaluation pass, no, like, no. no. Pick again. Okay, well, I mean, 
if, if I move it back, which looks really odd, I suppose the idea is you've got to take on e5. So now I'm going to do something. I guess I you can, you can do bishop back. takes pawn. Yeah, bishop takes pawn. I guess pawn. you could check. You have to go and to e7. Step, and now you can pick up the pawn on b5, queen takes queen. Yeah, and this is minimum a pawn up for white, isn't it? Yeah? Yeah. This is minimum a pawn up. So, um, okay, so yeah, this is, this is um, I don't know, it just feels to me, Ivanka, that if black, black has played d6, so now um, Polina is going to have a long think, and I expect the critical move is e5. When black probably take on e5, it just feels like white's got great development and a very dangerous position for black. Maybe the position's not as bad as I think. Maybe maybe uh, it's kind of okay for black, but this e5 move breaking things up could be very, very scary. And uh, I think Polina, in a, in a must-win situation, she couldn't really have asked for a better opening list with the white pieces, right? So it's worked um well. It certainly looks like a lot of fun. So let's go back to the bird's eye view and have a look at some of the other games. We also have Bella Kotinashvili. She's in a must-win situation as she lost with the black pieces against former women's world champion Tan Zhongyi. And of other big matchups, we also have Harika against Goryashkina and two friends playing each other, Elizabeth Pates and Anna Mazichuk. I was trying to, they had these nicknames for each other and I couldn't remember, I can't remember. One was Miss Solid, the other one was Miss Messy. And I can't remember which way it goes. But I would just guess that Anna Mazichuk was Miss Solid. Right, okay. Well, should we, should we go to that game now we mentioned it? Because yeah. the, the queens are off in every single game except the one we were just looking at. So um, lots of queen exchanges, must be a lot of nerves at stake. But the Elizabeth Pats game versus Anna Mazichuk has reached this position with Elizabeth having the so-called advantage of the white pieces. They drew their first game. And I expect, you know, the players can be so nervous, maybe more nervous if they've drawn their first game, Ivanka, because they're like, I really don't want to make a mistake here. Yeah? If I make a mistake and I get knocked out because of that, I'm going to be kicking myself. So you would expect them to be playing more solid chess, hence why there's been many draws. And um, I don't know if we've got time to go over all the moves now. Probably not. Let's just stick with the current position. Bishop a6, just played by Anna Mizichuk. And um, my first thoughts, okay, we, we can just look at the pieces. Black's got this nice knight in the center, but at some point, maybe white could consider taking that or getting rid of that. Black's got this majority of pawns on the queen side. And what that does mean that in, in the ending, if you get more and more pieces off the board, these pawns could be quite strong because they can create a pass pawn. And the white king is a long way from stopping that one. On the other hand, white's got pawns in the center. So if white can get those, you know, you really want to try to get your pawns mobilized where they are strongest. So playing f3, playing e4 could be a standard idea from, from white here. But I would have thought this is pretty, pretty even. Um, and the evaluation bar kind of agrees with that, but not, not a boring even. It's quite dynamically unbalanced, Shivanka. Yeah, I, I, it is quite dynamically unbalanced. I mean, first of all, Black is potentially threatening Bishop takes Knight to ruin White's central pawns. And then there's also, as you've highlighted there, that Bishop on G2, that piece is a sleeping giant. You know, if somehow you were able to destabilize the protection of the Knight on D5, you know, that Bishop is just simply going to cut the board into and also let's not forget there's an open c line whoever controls that is going to be in for some happy days so and also just to add to my, my point there's actually a forcing move i don't know whether it's any good but it certainly has to be calculated can white play knight to f4 yeah this this is exact this is my um first thought as well ivanka knight f4 i mean i think i think that shows that generally you know when you get positions you should kind of look at the forcing moves first. You can see Lizzie in the camera there having a good think about this position. Her opponent, Anna, is, is walking around. Uh, Lizzie considering options. Very experienced player, so they shouldn't be as nervous maybe as some of the other ones, but always look at the most forcing moves because knight f4 is trying to eliminate the knight on in the middle of the board. So let, let's just have a look at that and we can see this move, an option, because this knight, yeah, I want to open up my bishop and also i want to like needle that pawn and i think now black can't defend both of these 
points here. So black will have to take on f4. Now we can quickly calculate that if I go bishop takes rook, black has the intermezzo, knight takes e2 check, and then you can minimum take the bishop back and black at the end of that would have a knight and bishop for the rook, which is a good deal for black. So here white has to take this knight back. It makes no sense doubling pawn. So let's take with a bishop. This is threat to the rook again here. And I don't think, again, we can eliminate bishop takes e2 because I just attack your bishop and I'll be attacking your bishop and your rook. So something like rook c8. And it kind of should have helped white to get rid of this knight. But I think the issue here, Yvanka, is that black is ready. As you said, the c file, very important. There's a threat to e2. And black, black is ready to play a move like rook c2 and just take over that open file. And even though this pawn looks quite weak, and you might be able to play a move like d5 at the right moment. Black's pieces look great. So again, it's, it's, it's really in the balance so far. Uh, I, I, would, I would have fought this position, Ivanka. Yeah, totally. And then that begs the question, if white can't play knight f4, if it doesn't lead to anything, then how else is white going to try to nurture? And you have to think, OK, well, maybe the bishop on, you know, because remember, black is threatening to play bishop takes knight. Do you think this and is a threat? I was, I was, I was, I was about thinking that. about it and I was yeah. thinking, yeah, it could be because of the, the rook coming to d8 and then the bishop coming to f6. And yeah, I, I was wondering. I, I like does... my pawn structures. Yeah, I know you, you love your you love your sensible pawns. You're like me. I, I we all like, you know, we all like the beautiful things in life, don't we? Like, you know, when <laughs> when uh, you, you'd rather not have a crew. I kind of like the, you know, the, the sort of more sometimes there's beauty in ugliness. Right. And uh Double pawns like that, I'm kind of wondering, they do look ugly, but I do get the open E file and I can start to maybe harass that pawn. There's maybe some benefits of allowing you to take the knight on D3. Maybe some. Not sure about many, but some. The more I'm looking at this, Yvanka, the more I'm actually thinking I like black, just because it seems a bit easier for black to play. Even though you can often have equal positions, you've got to ask yourself, which side would I rather be in because the plans are easier. And I kind of think like, you're right. I've got it. You know, white's got to consider this move. Black's got a very easy idea also coming rook to the open file. In the long run, this queen side majority is going to be very dangerous for white. So I kind of like slightly prefer black here, I think, actually. Slightly. Yeah. My, my so. vibe is also, unless white finds a really good move now, that the situation could start to favor black. Yes, but we will see. And if Anna Mazichuk wins, then she moves on to the semifinals. Yeah. OK, let's have a look at another game. So um, we can just bring up the bird's eye view. So we've come to them and we just have a quick look uh, and see where else we're going to go. And um, all games incredibly tense. We mentioned there's been many queen exchanges and um, I think we, we can quickly go to um, Harika's game, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. There was I mean, the. the to, to my eyes, the Polina game is the most interesting, but we've got to catch up with the other ones going on. And let's just do the current position here. And this is Harika versus Alexandra. Um, or China. Lots of things happened here. I mean, I say we can just have a look, but where were we? We're all the way back here. And it seemed like they both were just very well prepared. So I'm not going to go through the moves. There's been far too many. Let's do the current position. It, I mean, yeah. to my eyes, again, black has, you know, it seems fairly even. I don't see either side with any serious weaknesses. Uh, you, you try to find weaknesses. The material is equal to assess a position. Both sides' pawns look fairly fairly okay. I mean, again, my first thought would be I, I, I kind of prefer black because I've got maybe some potential to attack this one. But white's also got an open file in the middle. So fairly even position here. I, I, yeah, I would say fairly even. I mean, the first thing that I'm looking at is, yeah, I mean, the material count is level, but there is an imbalance in terms of pawn structure, in terms of pawn majorities. Uh, white has the possibility of creating pass pawn, uh, black also on the queen side. And then I'm going to judge who has the more mobile pawns. And I think potentially white. But even then, that, that situation is a super double-edged because you can also see that 
c6 can happen i mean the knight on c3 isn't a great piece it's just i think it's just dynamically balanced yeah i agree i think i would prefer i would prefer white just because i think that playing king g2 g4 king g3 is something that kind of speaks for itself yeah i mean i suppose black you say the mobile pawns being black's got this idea of going d5 mm. c5 you know using these pawns yeah. as well i mean it, it, it looks to my eyes like pretty even right and probably you know a good quality game that you know it's the berlin i mean you're going to play the Berlin or play it on the white side. What more do you expect in a position like this? Pretty even, pretty dull, and uh, pretty drawn. <laughs> you know, that's what you get when you play the Berlin, and you know your theory. You get you get this kind of nonsense, and um, not it's much like more to say. Really, the process of chess, right? You just you, look at the position, just... go draw, move on. Should we move draw. on, Simon? <laughs> Let's move <laughs> on. Yeah, that Let's one's move on me, to really. someone who cannot afford draw, and that is Bella Kotinashvili. Really. Because she's playing with the white pieces against Tan Zhong Yi, and in yesterday's encounter, Tan Zhong Yi won in a beautiful way with a sacrifice. So here, a draw would be a disaster for Bella. So Bella, with the white pieces, must win this position. And well, I think we can do the moves here. Actually, this is quite an interesting, interesting position, and uh, it's funny how. We've seen that, you know, in, in the must-win scenarios, we saw Salem do this as well. Um, Bella doing it here. The knight f3 on move one. And, and I, I would have thought that this move now, compared to 1e4, is a better way to play for a win. And you might think, what are, what are you, crazy? Because e4 is the most aggressive move. It's really exciting. It always has been. But uh, the problem is, you just saw the Berlin. If black wants to get an easy game, the Berlin is such a pain. And knight f3 keeps more pieces on the board. And let's see, we see the Reti. This is the, the start of the Reti. Black gaining space. White playing this break here. You don't need to play that way. It's more about personal choice. It's a reverse Grunfeld opening this, meaning that when these pawns get exchanged, black has the good center, but white has pressure against the center. And after this move e6, white hitting out there in the center of the board. And now a very common idea unleashing the beast, the bishop on g2. Knight a3, the knight trying to just win the pawn back, and this might be some kind of theory. Black's a pawn up, but white has decent pressure here. And we have some exchanges. Queen b6, black only needing a draw, decides to get the queens off, but that means black doubles her pawns here. And now rook d1, yeah, okay, I want to win that pawn back, please. Black says, well, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna needle you there. And what is the point of this? Because white does win the pawn back. The point is black gets a bit of a tempo attacking the rook. The rook has to move again. And this is where we are currently at, with white needing to win uh, this position. Um, and we can do a quick assessment. I mean, Yvanka, I mean, quick assessment. Would you prefer white or black here? Oh, that's a difficult question, actually, because mm. uh, the rook on d2 is like, what on earth is happening there? Yeah. Because it just jams in the bishop, and by consequence, the rook on a1. And, but then again, white does have this beautiful bishop on g2 hitting at b7. And if you're careless, you know, you do have moves like b3 that will unravel the whole position. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I guess if White's able to, uh, I mean, let's just say Rook B8, which is a horrible passive move. Which is a move. horrible move. But let's exactly. just say then... White is able to unravel with like this, yeah. and then Bishop B2. Suddenly, White has a fantastic position because, as you mentioned, this Bishop is beautiful. The other Bishop is quite nice. Black's pawns look ugly, and the Rooks are coming in. This would be a dream situation for White, right? This this position yeah. here, yeah? So Yeah. But then the, then the question is, how do you defend that pawn on b7? I mean, mm -hmm. do you really want to step up a rook to a7? I mean, or the alternative is just to put a knight onto d5. Yeah, or, or you could try just castling, make it a gambit. I mean, I think that the danger is in these positions, yeah. I mean, if, if black was in a situation where black didn't need to draw, I think 
you know, anyone, any human being would be like, well, okay, I'm, I'm more open to risk. I don't mind giving up a pawn if I'm going to get loads of activity. But when you only need a draw, you you might go a little bit too passive. And I, I kind of feel that's one of the biggest mistakes in chess in general is to start playing really passive. And like Rook A7, I don't know, that could be a better way to do it, Ivanka, but it's very passive. I like your Knight D5 or Castles. One of, yeah, you know, Knight D5, maybe, maybe that's the way to play and when you're just saying okay you can win a pawn but i'm going to get the bishop there right so it al- could be interesting al- i've also been inspired by uh prague you know how prague never defends he always counterattacks. so there is yeah. one possibility of a counterattack. so knight d5 that would be my sacrifice that i would be in te- uh, really tempted to try um bishop b3 is another idea that i just suddenly oh. saw yeah just the what is happening here? I'm pressing buttons. A grand reset. It didn't happen, Simon. We just imagined no, it all. <laughs> no, just, uh, just showing off some chess.com features. And um, Bishop B3. And that doesn't work. The evaluation part goes, that's a terrible move. It would get be awarded the double question mark. Blunder. Yeah. Made the game. Lost. Well, I guess what happens if you take here, right? I yeah. Mean, this that, is the, the, yeah. Isn't, Oh, like, oh, 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 this is horrible because you have to kind of go like rook a7, yeah? Yeah. And now bishop c6 is maybe not the end of the world because you can move the king here. But oh my words, there is a move which is the end of the world, knight c6. <gasps> with, with this one and this one. Two two big threats. Winning winning a yeah. rook outright. So it's a nice idea, but just it's tactically... Right doesn't quite work at the moment right um i i think you're either your knight d5 or if i was black here i'd probably just castle as well i'd be like okay look that pawn is rubbish you've got this congestion here discombobulated so why 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 do i care about a pawn let's just use my initiative and if white now takes on a7 well can i even go rook b8 or am i is that stupid i mean it might just be a pawn down here as well this is my problem, Ivanka. I'm just so happy to give up pawns when and then I lose the ending. I'm like, why did I give that yeah. pawn up? You're an idiot. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, the, the rook on d2 is pretty well defended. So mm-hmm. uh, there is certain tension there. And of course, remember, white is threatening to unravel with b3 and bishop b2 at the right time. So yeah. complex position and a big question for Tang yeah. Zhongyi. And that is why she is thinking about I think it's whether she just... should defend. I think it's just worth pointing out that you know white can't play b3 yet um you want to play this but i don't think you can because because of this pin right i mean mm-hmm. this is the you know the one thing that might be well not the one thing but this is this is good for black because if white can play this against any move i think white would be doing really well here because you gain a tempo you develop your bishop but as white can't play that one easily because of the pin there's a bit of getting out of jail uh, to be done here i don't know though. i mean it looks like white's better to me i mean okay rook a7 was played and i suppose one of the more natural moves you've anchored just defending the pawn when you only need a draw right yep it's very tempting actually to play in a solid way when you're in that kind of situation and uh let's go back to the open section and have a look at the bird's eye view because we have some huge matchups there I mean, one game that we haven't touched upon, which of course for me is perhaps also going to be one of the matches of the round, is between Jan Krzysztof Duda and Fabiano Caruana. And these two players are just exceptional. Let's face it. Jan Krzysztof Duda winning the 2021 World Cup, defeating Magnus Carlsen along the way. He has the white pieces. What do we think about this position because I'm just looking at the bird's eye view and you can see, oh, hello, king on g2, bishop pair versus a knight pair. Who is mm. going to win? Oh, king g2 awarded a question mark by the computer. Okay, well, let's see. Uh, just looking at the opening moves, I always find it quite interesting. I mean, these, these are two of the biggest heavy hitters, aren't they? I mean, you, you've got, you don't need to introduce these players, everyone knows about Duda, who won this competition, was it last time around where he beat Magnus Carlsen? But he beat Magnus Carlsen in the semi-final to um, to actually win the whole thing. So it's obviously a format he likes. But then Fabiano is, is probably playing some of the best chess he's ever played. I mean, maybe he realizes that 
he's still got a chance of becoming world champion, which of course he does. All these guys do because Magnus now dropping out and he's kind of, that maybe has given him another bit of inspiration in his career to play good chess. And uh, okay, we'll, we'll stick with current positions as there's a lot to look at. King G2 being played. And as you you said, it's, it's a very unbalanced situation here. They drew their first game. The reason it's unbalanced, first of all, you have the two bishops versus the two knights. General thinking is that the two bishops can be very strong and stronger than the two knights. So that, you would have thought, works in White's favour. But on the other hand, this pawn has kind of wandered a little bit too far away from White's king, yeah? I mean, if White could go king g1 and then maybe put the pawn back here, I think White would be very happy. But having a pawn on g4, it does open up your king, and Black surely must be trying to think of ways to take advantage of that with a move like f5. Try to get the rook in the game. Try to attack that king. You don't want to exchange queens if you're black here because then the bishops will become more powerful. You, I think you want to try to target this king. And uh, to my eyes, f5 just looks very tempting here. You know, let's get the rook in the game. I could also try to bring the queen over at the right time and, and attack, yeah? Yeah, yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I mean, black has to unsettle the position. And whilst we have the live board up and the analysis board up, maybe we can just have a look at f5 because that is the natural move. And when you are attacking the opponent's king, as Simon indicated, you have to open lines. That is the currency of the position. And the first thing for white to think about is how on earth are you going to stabilize the king? Is it not easy? <laughs> I mean, I'm just looking at. I would love to play F3, F3 here. Three. F3 looks critical, yeah, right? I think this is does. like most most people in this position would, would be like, that knight is a really strong piece. It's kind of attacking my position. But we're going to get a very fascinating line here just by following natural play. Because if you leave that knight there, black's always going to get some attacking chance. So I play F3. And if the knight now goes backwards, I'm like, Phew, we, we, you know, you kind of breathe a sigh of relief because you got rid of that knight. But can black now throw and i'm just checking this with the computer so i am cheating i'm not a genius i'm cheating can i throw the queen in to h4 i was i was thinking about that but that was just backed up with very little calculation so the whole idea is that uh, after pawn takes knight you're just simply going to capture on g4 yeah i mean it looks like you have to take the knight right because otherwise the queen is threatened to, to come yeah, in yeah and so it's like get... hello <laughs> semi quarterfinals yeah indeed and and a win for either player in this game means they they go through this you know and the point yeah the point of this move is if you take here i i obviously take with the f pawn because i want my rook to to have some fun as can well you, can you and, take um, the g pawn sorry can you take the g-pawn i wasn't sure which way to go but i like the g-pawn oh take the g-pawn yeah okay so, that, that so, even more so hello, yeah darkness my yeah. old friend yeah that looks a lot stronger. no no that I, didn't I, yeah yeah i was considering taking here gain and tempo capture here which might might also be quite interesting but you're right let's open up the white king even more and this is obviously a much better move because we're getting rid that is that dodgy pawn on g4 and this line is kind of showing just how scary White's king can be. And, you know, with, with the queen side being so badly positioned, White's playing without the rook and the bishop and the queen. It's not really a surprise that the white king is getting opened up here. Yeah? And let's just let's continue. There's a big threat. Queen takes pawn. So let's say you take here. I take with check. I might as well. Does black have anything better than a draw here? I expect the answer is a, a big yes by at the right moment getting the other rook into the game. Oh, hang on a yeah. second. Is there like weird moves? I almost feel like if I got rid of the king from G8, <laughs> it was like yeah, um, just some abracadabra stuff. You know, maybe just remove it from the board completely. You have like the old, good old fashioned lawnmower, mate, Rook H8. Well, maybe, so... maybe you could maybe you could try recastling. You know, you like <laughs> you're like uh, r r rewind, and you and you like you put the king back there, and you put the rook back there, and you and you say checkmate. <laughs> And you just see what your opponent does, and they're like, what is going on? I have entered the twilight zone. Checkmate, my friend. R I'd love to just see someone do that. I mean, I remember doing that 
this sounds quite bad, but I think it was 12 years old and I was playing King's Crusher, a famous YouTuber. And um, he was about to checkmate me in, in a tournament game. And he went walking around the tournament looking so confident, like, I'm going to crush this little kid. And I thought, well, I'm going to resign, but actually I, I'm going to just scare him a little bit first. So I, I moved my queen into a position that checkmated him. And I just sat there like a little naughty 12-year-old. He came back to the board and I, and I said, checkmate. And he looked <laughs> like he was going to have a heart attack, the poor guy. He was just like, he started like, I felt pretty guilty. He started shaking uh, because I cheated. I'm missing to it. And then, uh, <laughs> and then like, I said, checkmate. And he was like, what? what? And he didn't realize because he basically had forced checkmate against me. And I just moved my queen to. And then I said, look, I'm only joking. I'll resign. <laughs> but the poor, the poor guy, for those moments, I think he, yeah, he, he must have lost. He must have lost some <laughs> sensibility. Poor guy. He's, you know, he's yeah. just, he's, he's just waiting for me to resign, Ivanka. And uh, you're not the first funny. person. You're not the first person who did that. My husband did that to a grandmaster. Oh, really? Grandmaster Ooh. was not happy with him. <laughs> <Yeah>. My husband <laughs> had signed the score sheet to say that he'd resigned and everything. But he just thought, if I move my piece here, then just to see the look on his face, and the grandmaster yeah. was so annoyed, he just like yeah. threw the score sheet at my husband. And oh, I was dear. like, wow. <laughs> I think you got to. I think you got to pick the the right the right guy. Yeah. yeah? I mean, because yeah. King's Crusher has, has got a good sense of humour. Lovely guy, and um, I think you know playing a little joke before he resigns is uh, is okay. But if you if you pick the wrong guy, you you, you might just get in a lot of trouble. Yeah, uh, I mean you could. I'd love it, Ivanka, if you could play like King H seven here, Rook H eight, King G eight, checkmate. Imagine that yeah. you move your king to give checkmate. That'd be like the coolest checkmate good. ever. But yeah. is there a, okay? So if, okay, so we've been like joking, yeah. like get the king out of the way. I mean. It really does feel like black is super close to checkmate. Is there? I think I think the simplest would be a... here to just you know let's maybe give another check, just because I want to get my queen out of the way. And now I'm just going to get rid of that defender. And the other reason is I can take on e4 with check now. Yeah. Now that I moved your king here, let's say yeah. you take with a bishop, and now I, now I swing the big piece in, and I've kept these you three pieces go. over here. And you can't go queen g3 because that will drop the bishop on uh, f1. Yeah, queen g3, I'll take and take on f8. I'm threatening rook h2. Sorry, rook f2, queen h2, mate. Uh, this, this, I, I don't think, I don't think white can defend this position. I mean, there's just too much happening in, in, in this position. Yeah. But I, I suppose what you do, Ivanka, as well, if you got this in a, in a tournament, right, and you were black, I don't think you'd even need to calculate that far. If you got to this situation and you could see that you had a perpetual, you could be a bit lazy, follow your instincts. You'd be like, I've, I've at least got a perpetual check with the black pieces, but I might have more. So I can try to work it out when I get a bit a bit further. That's maybe what I would do. I mean, F5 looks like a really nice move to me, but it, it, it wasn't played here. Oh, it wasn't played? It wasn't played, no. Oh, okay. And uh, has well, Rick... I see Rook C8, and that was awarded. Was that awarded a? That was awarded an X. It was. So it's that was, spot. yeah. Yeah. Didn't find the key move, and I guess a five must have been right. I think so. But I mean, go, go the thing the is, though, the thing is, though, you know, we are looking at this position from the comfort of our computers. We have the evaluation bar going. At some point, we can check with the engine. We can always take back. And it's really understandable, uh, Fabiano, before initiating F5, which is a move I'm sure he feels he can play at any time, yeah. wants to just introduce all his pieces into the attack. Yeah, I agree. I mean, moving a rook to the open file, I, I think giving this a, a, an X is, is a, little bit, uh, a little bit harsh because there can't be a more natural move than getting your rook to an open file and just, uh, you know, uh, plonk it along there. Uh, I, I I like the the game review it says miss okay I didn't realize that they're making up new uh, new things it's, it's a miss okay but I mean this can't be this can't be a terrible move it's just maybe that missed opportunity to play a five and I think now it's going to be like whether White can settle the position maybe now White has a chance to develop this bishop which is going to help his defense I actually quite like putting it here because we remember the queen was always threatening to come into g3 and some of those scary lines. And this bishop looks very active on this diagonal. And if white can like play this move and maybe settle, 
make some exchanges, I think white will start taking over. I mean, Black's idea might be to go knight c4. So, you know, those knights could also be quite vicious. Mm. But, you know, it's kind of short-term play against white's weakened king, against the longer play of the two bishops here. Um, we'll, we'll wait and see. But in the balance at the moment, in the balance at the moment, uh, you, there you said it, Simon. And uh, let's revisit one other game, which I'm kind of very curious. It's Magnus Carlsen with the black pieces against uh, Vasil Ivanchuk. Let's take a meander there and see what has happened. Yeah. Because we thought, you know, White was doing relatively well, had a strong pawn center, but Magnus had to play precisely. So we left it around, I think, just a few moves on from here. Yeah, so in this position, um, wow, this has gone. This has gone very interesting. Avancha with the white pieces needs to draw, and I, I would have thought, realistically, not many. If you, you know, if you're really going to be honest, not many players are going to give Avancha that much of a chance, just because when Magnus needs to draw, he nearly always draws. He's very, very hard to beat. I mean, uh, I don't know. What about people in the chat? Do you, do you, do you think? Did you think that Vanchuk had very good chances here? Let's see, because the next move, it does seem logical. It's one of those moves we mentioned earlier, but it's very slow. I mean, rook a8 here, that seemed like a good normal move. Knight to d8, that knight is trying to sit here. But the problem, as we said before, is the knight could also be hit with an f5 move there. Chucky now moves his knight out of the way. And I think this is following the plan we mentioned, that the f-pawn is now ready to come to f4, followed by g4, followed by f5. White must win. He needs to take some chances. Magnus hits with this b4 idea. And um, we talked about this earlier, and we assumed that c4 would be a nice answer because now black has to capture and get rid of his central pawn. The bishop takes, you might think that's a little bit odd, but the bishop keeps control of some key squares, including this one. Maybe the other pawn's getting ready to yeah. go. And the knight is getting ready to go to b3, which is, as we know, knights are perfect blockaders. It is. And we have a couple more moves. I mean, there might be better options, but the queen comes over to a4, getting some mm -hmm. control of the queen side. Magnus going very passive here. Rook b7. And now, again, I didn't expect this move. Knight comes to f1 uh, because it did look very natural over there. Let's just get to the current position. Magnus gets his knight into the center. Pressure now here, and knight g3 is played. This is where we are standing. And the first question is, well, there is a pawn on pre. That looks really dangerous to take. But it's changed quite a lot, the, the position so far. Yeah. And uh, that is the first question that one must answer because the bishop is under fire. So, of course, you know, black could play bishop g6. Yeah. But knight takes pawn. Can you steal that pawn? I don't think you can. So if Magnus does take here, I'm assuming I can. I can't. I, I was thinking about pinning this one, but it doesn't really help. But uh, the, the most forcing move is obviously to take the knight and then look at taking the bishop. And I think white has a bit of an intermezzo again. I can take this knight now, where you have to take back, otherwise you'd be a piece down. I don't capture your bishop in this position, because you capture my bishop, and, and that doesn't help. So uh -huh. I've got to look at ways to defend my bishop, gain a useful tempo. And I think bishop a6, attacking the rook, and attacking there will win, win the exchange, and, and probably win the game for Chucky here. We see we have a couple more moves on the board, so let's just keep up with what's happened. That pawn. Couldn't be, couldn't be taken because of that. And what did Magnus do? Well, he very sensibly did your suggestion of Aki just getting the bishop back to a good square there, bishop yeah. g6. But, but this game still very dangerous for Ivanchuk. You know, his pieces are very active. And I think it's the perfect time to leave you all on a cliffhanger because we are going to take a short break and... After we return, we will come back straight to this position and we will dive in to some more analysis. So don't go anywhere and see you in a few minutes.
This right here is how I use Chessable and why. I've been using it for a long time. I mean, if you look up here, I actually have my streak. It says 1,231 days, right? You're gonna forget a lot of the things that are in the book. Chessable came around when I got on Chessable. It's literally, I was already doing that. So this is now a game changer because I can do it faster. It's online, it's in front of me. All of my books are here. There's gonna be folders now so I can categorize by white, black, and all tactics in game. But I literally have everything in one area. As you see, I'm scrolling here. This is what I like. So they're like, how many Chessable books you got? I'm like, all of them. How I use Chessable is actually, I do a lot for the opening training. I do tactics on here. I do calculation. I do in game. I do everything but the database. All my training on here all the time. Chessable is the wave. This is why I like to use Chessable. It's actually helped me. I remember even online, I was only like capping out at 2350, almost 2400 and, and blitz and bullet. My chess comp is 26 with a high of 2774 and bullet. And I blame all of this it, like success really is just working on Chessable. Just being honest with you. Have you come to play? Oh, yeah. Pay your five dollars and get in the chair. How are you? My name is Jude Akers. Chess has given me a life in that chess table, which evolved to a place where no one wanted to be, has totally given me a world. You might cry about all the things that happened to me as a kid. Don't cry. I sailed through everything. The moment I found the first book of chess by Joseph Fleming, I was gone. And I bought a um, plastic chess set in a drugstore, um, ESLO company with a little manual by Frank J. Marshall, the legendary grandmaster. I put it on my bedspread and it gave off rays. I was gone, a gone pecan. And I, it literally, will keep you alive if nothing else is going right. Chess has the power to literally, as Taraj said, make people happy. And welcome back everyone. And while we see Magnus pondering here, let's have a look at what motivates Magnus to participate in the FIDE World Cup. Magnus Carlsen has already won almost every tournament imaginable, most of them several times. Norway Chess, five times. Tata Steel Chess, eight times. The World Rapid and Blitz, a combined 10 times. And of course, the World Championship, five times. Wait a second, we have history. Magnus Carlsen is now the five-time world chess champion. Most players are at the World Cup because it is part of the world championship system. Magnus is not here for that. 
so why is he here? This one event has eluded his otherwise ironclad grip on the chess scene. Despite the hits he's taken in this tournament, it's a format he enjoys. Personally, for me, the World Cup is such a prestigious uh, and interesting event. Um, so I'm very happy to take part. So he keeps coming back. 2023 will be Carlsen's fifth shot at the World Cup since 2005. To this point, he's only gotten as far as the semifinals. To be fair to Magnus, his first try came when he was 13 years old and seeded 97th. The prodigy announced his arrival with a 10th place finish. By 2007, he was a semi-finalist. After that, other events took over as Magnus worked his way to the World Championship. He skipped the World Cup for a decade. In 2017, Magnus surprised everyone. He decided he wanted another chance at the Cup. Unfortunately, it ended up as his most disappointing try to date. Hu Zhengzhu beat him in the third round. 2023 now marks the second time, and first in 16 years, that Magnus has played back-to-back -back World Cups. In 2021, it appeared he might finally break through and win it all, but the young Jan Chistov Duda stopped him in the semifinals. You can't win them all, they say, but once Magnus takes down the World Cup, he will have won them all. Is this the year he breaks through and checks one last thing off his to-do list? And there we see Magnus concentrating hard while he plays with the black pieces against Vasily Ivanchuk. And that is the question, Simon, right? Can Magnus Carlsen win this elusive title? Yeah, I mean, he, he certainly can. I mean, he, he's the favourite by quite a big margin to win it. I mean, he is still the best player in the world. I don't think any of his peers uh, doubt it. The, the only people who doubt that are just mad, to be honest, a bit bonkers. Uh, so he, he's a great player. And this is an event that the only event really he hasn't won. He's won everything else. But it, it was, you know, if you were listening to the um, interviews in the last couple of days, it was it was intriguing to hear him um, feel quite stressed out. I think that's the only way to explain it. And to, you know, he's very honest in his interviews. I mean, that's, this is one, one of the reasons I think so many people really like Magnus. He always has been. Uh, you know, people in the past, that they've been very cagey when interviewed. They don't say their true feelings. But Magnus was basically, you know, he just, just said what he thought. And he just said, uh, I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> you know, why am I putting myself <laughs> through this much stress? Uh, and I don't know if many people would actually say that, but probably many people actually think that. But that is kind of part of the process, right, Yvanka? It is very stressful, but that's kind of the fun as well, right? Without the stress you wouldn't get the ups and the excitement. So I think everyone feels that stress, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, whether you're in a, you, remember, you have to also remember that Magnus Carlsen, when he's playing against Vincent, he was in a must win situation. He's got in the back of the head that he doesn't want to leave the competition so early because then it would be embarrassing for him. And he's also confessed to having those jitters that, you know, he feels the stress and yesterday, you know, he played brilliantly as always, but he did say that, you know, he was missing a few things in the opening. And uh, sorry to interrupt yeah. you, Anka, but if you look at Ivan Chuk's face, then, um, you know, just look at his face. Uh, it, he, he's shaking, he's shaking his head, Ivan Chuk. We will just catch up with the moves. Has something gone wrong for him? I, I think we need to catch up with the moves, right? Because uh, he's one of those, you know, easy to read books, Ivan Chuk. If something's not going right, we will know. And just to catch up, he played rook to d1. Um, already you can wonder what is the knight doing there. He's moving really quickly as well. He's got over an hour on the clock and he's playing like blitz chess. Magnus now plays a very nice idea. There's a beautiful square in the middle of the board. So he moves his knight around to control that lovely square. Rook a5 trying to pressurize that knight. Now, Rook A7, maybe this is the move that Chucky missed. And they're playing so quick. He's still playing Blitz Chess. What is happening? So Rook comes to A1. They're still moving. Calm down, guys. The right. other Rook comes over. and the, Rook takes Rooks happen. Rook takes Rook. Rook takes Rook and Queen takes. Okay, 
So I think we've had many exchanges, Jovanka. What? And now one more move, knight to e2. Sorry, I was going, I was going very quickly there. Uh, I mean, the obvious question is what happens if you take the knight? And I, I think the simple answer is this pawn is just far too strong. For example, yeah, white wins a pawn, but now um, you always have to worry about this B pawn. It doesn't matter being a pawn up here. Um, you can even probably just throw this in and support your B pawn. So you can't do that. Um, knight e2 played. He's, he, but he's, he, it doesn't seem like Van Trix himself, right? Because he's playing so quick and to me. It, it just seems like he, he's very, very rejected at the moment during, well, during this game. He is in a must-win situation. And take a look at what's happened. You know, before, when we left it, yeah, you know, Black had the possibility of getting this past pawn. But White had a kingside attack brewing. And, of course, nice central control. Here it's just an end game where White has a zero kingside attack. And also, it's all, as you mentioned, it's all about that B pawn. And that B pawn is A, B supported by a bishop on G6 and also the bishop on E7. Where is the winning chances? In fact, I would say that black is the only one with winning chances here. And when you're in a must-win situation, well, that is not good news. No, 100% agree. And uh, you might even consider like a move like Queen A3, uh, trying to swap the mm. queens off it in this situation if you wanted to. I mean. Even if you don't play that now, that, that's a move that's kind of lurking here. Um, the other thing is, you know, if white is never capturing this pawn on d5, you, you can't really get rid of this blockade. And that is such a beautiful piece, the knight on d5. So, you, you know, you might just play a move like h6. I'd be very tempted right. to play this move. So my and, king and has it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, even as I'll show you, I was just thinking about, say, what happens if white tries to play it positionally, like say bishop takes knight, and after pawn takes, pawn takes a bishop, knight to f4 saying, well, look at that, I might win a pawn, and queen a3 is already this kind yeah. of stuff that could happen. Yeah, I mean, and... this move, it's such a horrible move, Ivanka, isn't it, mm. always, because the black king is very safe especially with a light square bishop on h7. But this b pawn, or if it's an a pawn, this, this pawn's going to win the game, isn't it? Yeah. For, for black. So, uh, and this is what Ivanchuk is starting to realise. I mean, he, I think where he went wrong, he, he played this knight around to g3. And I, I think if you go back there, Ivanchuk, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. If you go compare the positions, somehow the black knight got to this square Look how bad the black knight is here, yeah? It's mm -hmm. going to take one, two, three moves. And this knight maneuver didn't really get white anywhere. You could just put the knight on b3, blockading this pawn, trying to come there. And you might even better go super aggressive here. You might be able to play like f4 and try to go g4 and just really go for it. But it started to go wrong for Chucky when he started to play knight f1 it's just too slow and again yeah. catching up with the current position it's really improved drastically for black Ivanka, and i i i think magnus is going to comfortably hold this and go through to the next round and i remember your words of warning right at the beginning you said if you're playing magnus carlson and you want to beat him do not take it into an end game and certainly yeah. don't take it into an end game if you're just a little bit worse because Magnus, he is the end game magician. So good news for Magnus fans. Probably sad news for Chucky. I don't think he will be able to get that required victory he so desperately needs. Shall we go back to the bird's eye view and see what's happening in other games? Yeah, let's do it. So, I mean, that, that little video we saw before this as well, talking about Magnus and will he... Uh, win this World Cup. Well, again, he is the favourite. Um, you got to, you know, you got to ask about his motivation a bit because he did step out of the World Championships, and I, I think he's still really motivated. He just prefers the quicker time limits, and um, we could see a shift uh, going more towards those time limits as uh, as things develop. Right, loads of interesting positions there, Ivanka. I'm trying to. But yeah, but we we should we should catch up on the ones we haven't actually managed to see. There's so there's a few. There's Gukash against Wang Hao. There's Nepomniachtchi against uh, Vidit, and uh, of course Alexei Sarana now representing Serbia. 
He's in a must-win situation against Lenya Dominguez. Shall we take a look at Kukash? 17 okay. years old with the white pieces. Can Wang Hao win this with the black? I mean, are we talking Mission Impossible here or is there some chances? Right, so we'll start with this one uh, and then we'll catch up on the other ones we haven't looked at so far. So this is the game between Gukesh, who is now the top player in India. This kid is just a phenomenon. Um, uh, there's so many fantastic Indian players. Uh, uh, as we've mentioned, they are they are you know really really dedicated. I think it's I think it's to do the you know uh, it's a real life changing thing, right? In India, if you become strong grandmaster, you, you can you can make a great career out of it, and it's got a great you're kind of a star in India if you play chess as well. I mean, in, in, in England, if you play chess, right, you know, if someone asks, asks me if I go and they say, what do you do as a living? I say, I'm a chess player. They basically look look at me like I'm completely mad, you know, and I probably need to be checked in somewhere. Now, whether that's the case or not, it's not a cool thing to be a chess player still. Uh, in India, it's a really cool thing. So I think that that kind of inspires the younger generation to really do something. Yeah. But when I talk to a lot of players, you anchor, they, they always say Gukesh, a lot of the guys say Gukesh, he's the one. I don't know which of the Indian players is stronger because there's too many of them, but he's so good, isn't he, Gukesh? Such Gukesh a good is player. fantastic. And do you almost forget watching him play and also seeing him in action that he's just 17 years old? And he's now on the quest to be the youngest person to have across 2,800. Ali Reza Faruja holds that record. And uh, just to kind of piggyback onto your point about the Indian talent, a lot of it's to do with having the right infrastructure you know the young kids are actually not obliged to go to school they just pass a few kind of obligatory exams here and there but they are allowed to dedicate themselves solely to chess they also like a really beautiful friendship net and support network between the lot of them i remember in chennai you'd often see them like just hanging out studying playing chess but then also playing t table tennis and just running around and that's super nice to see because I think you do need that friendly competitiveness in order to propel you forward. And talking about moving forward, Wang Hao playing with black pieces, can he win this one and take its tie breaks? Well, Wang, Wang Hao's style is normally grinding out very solid positions. And with the black pieces, um, he needs to do that here because, again, you evaluate a position, two things, the pawn structure and the pieces. And the pawn structure is dead even. You know, one side you couldn't claim to be slightly better. I mean, these pawns are, are the targets in the middle of the board. I think both sides will be looking at trying to grab one of them at the right time. Uh, the queens are lined up there, but it's very hard to do that because you'll, you'll get hit, you know, by a rook coming at the right time. Not now. The only other thing that makes the change is, okay, there's a knight versus bishop, and um, which piece is stronger? Generally, having a knight in the center of the board can be quite nice, but in the long run, if the queens come off, the bishop will, again, generally be better in an ending where there's pawns on both sides of the board, uh, and which there are here. And, and the reason for that is the bishop is just a long-range piece, so it can go to both sides of the board quickly. The knight is short-range. Yeah. And after but queen symmetry. b3... But the thing is that kind mm. of concerns me is the symmetry in the pawn structure because obviously, just to state the obvious, the bishop is only traveling on dark squares. The black knight can just hop around, jump around. And I don't know, somehow or other, I, I've got this kind of vague idea that the knight may be slightly better in this type of position just because you, you can just imagine it parked itself, if it, if it parked itself on e6 or even c6 it can target the d4 pawn and then if you follow that up with some rook moves to e4 i um i don't know it just it looks very level but i just suspect that maybe in an end game the knight might be better yeah I, it's just, a good but point, i'm talking small things yeah because the bishop can never attack the pawn there right yeah. The pawn is on a light square, the bishop is on a dark square, so we can never target this pawn. On the other hand, the knight can target that pawn. Uh, and I think this is the ideal square for the knight. It kind of depends, right, on timing. I mean, I, I would have thought in this position, if the queens come off, white will very easily draw this one. Um, 
don't see really that there's not that much danger yeah. is there i mean it's really small things one question before we move on is what happens if black grabs this pawn right yeah because okay if the queens come off let's put it on the board is there any way that i mean this okay it's double pawns but in you know compensation for that white has the open file i, I just can't see black ever winning this position i mean even if you've got your knight to e6 which is a long ask should be a draw then anyway yeah um, yeah, totally. So I and think uh, yeah, the pawns on B3 and B2, they don't look that weak because they can move forward. And yeah. also as compensation, you know, White has this lovely control of the A line. So let's have a look at the more critical one. Queen takes pawn because yeah. this will make a pawn grabber very happy. And you are a pawn yes. grabber. Songs were written about you. Is it, I'm a pawn grab, I want you to... I want to make you work one? hard. Yeah, that's right, Simon. All right. Is that, who's I'm going to grab that pawn. Uh, you want to sing it for me? Think. Can, you, can you give me a little tune to remind me of it? Oh, Simon, I, I've been, uh, been, I've been that practicing. Way I, I have been, I'm always tricked by you. You always say, sing something and like a bird. I'm like, yeah, Simon, let me impress you. Let me sing. But now I'm learning. Say no. And you know how I can say it nicely if I tell you, not this time, but I'm open to the idea. If you're, you're not open in. to the idea of singing now, I am, though. but not now. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Oh. I would always <laughs> sing for you, Yvanka. Okay. Well, actually, Go for no. It. Oh, no. Hang on a minute. Famous <laughs> last words. Um, <laughs> I'll take that back straight away. We've got a lot of commentary um, coming up, Simon. Oh, uh, I'm going to hold you yeah. to your word. Yeah. <laughs> and the, I, I, the, going back to the position, I mean, this this move kind of like there's no e easy reputa uh, refutation because you have a, a big threat, and this is where the queen and the queen and knight work very well. The big threat, so you take on f two. So I don't have time to play like rook d one. This is a move I kind of like to play because I just want to simply win that one back because obviously you just win win everything. So I can't play rook d one. So I would assume White's idea is to block this and to gain the tempo by just poking the bishop back. And now the queen has to decide where it's going to go to. Do we come back here, keeping the queens on the board, or do we now try to go for a queen exchange? My first thought would be, right, I've won a pawn. Let's go for a queen exchange. And of course, if the queens come off, Black's chances of winning have been drastically increased. So uh, this... Looks yeah, to me like White would have to grab there, and this is this is now getting a much more unbalanced, isn't it, Yvanka? This is the right. kind of position if you need to win, you need to go for with the black pieces. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Queen, queen takes pawn, and by the way, when I don't know why this thought occurred to me that the game review should have sound effects, like when you make a, a miss, it should go like Family Fortunes. <laughs> it does. Do you want me to turn them on? It does. Just give me, give me a second, yeah. Let me just turn them on. <laughs> miss. There you go. I'll turn them off again because they're quite annoying. Well, I've just turned them off again because they, they, I find them quite annoying. If you leave them on, you know, it gets really, especially in a time scramble, it can get really hectic. So I've turned them off there just so everyone doesn't have to deal with that anymore. But this is, mm -hmm. this is exactly the kind of position that black needs to go for. If you compare this, which is still all right for white, don't get me wrong, but you compare it to where they started, you can see it's a more dynamic position. It's still equal, but it's more dynamic. You have a passed pawn. Um, you know, the queen can be attacked. So I, I just feel Wang Hao's got to take on d4. I mean, I don't know how you follow this up. Maybe you can even play... Uh, D4 with a pawn now. D4. Why not? You know, use your pass pawn. Use the pass pawn. Yeah. Could be. Okay. And uh, well, we have to continue this because white is either lost or has some compensation. But bishop, okay, so your bishop moves. Bishop f4. Okay, so the bishop moves. And this pawn is like rolling, rolling, rolling. Look at that. I've also got threat of knight f2. I mean, this this is suddenly turned into oh, i'd be a little bit scared if i was white here right yeah. right and the queen on queen on b7 is doing a fantastic job mm -hmm. at uh, just defending any leak weak points so rook c1 just oh how to how to rook c1 walking into a d2 -er. 
Yeah. Maybe even D2 bishop now. Takes. The computer's saying D2 this now. Bishop... What the? Really? What is going on? I was banking on bishop takes pawn. I think that's just a draw, though. Okay, there's a nice line with, with D2. I mean, the thing is, you don't even need to calculate this far, right? When, when you're in an initial position, you, bank, you, you look at this and you've got the black pieces and you're like, right, I need to win. If I take the queens off, the position remains symmetrical. I'm playing Gukesh, quality player. It's going to be nearly impossible to win that. I think I, I think I must unbalance the situation. And he did. Did he do it? He did. So great choice from Wang Hao. Very experienced player. He's taken that pawn because now we get a different structure. And the game is gone. Bishop e3, queen c4. And now rook d1. Not grabbing that pawn. Gukesh is like, I'm just going to try to win that pawn back, keeping it very, very Simple. symmetrical. And now... Uh, and this, is, this is clever stuff from Gukesh. Very clever, because he's, he's got a lot of pressure on the pawns. He's got pressure on that pawn and on that pawn. Black now decides to take the queens off and defend this pawn. And, well, it's definitely heading towards a draw. This rook d1 was a quality move, Yvanka, wasn't it? It was a good, it's a fantastic really, move. really good move. Because if we go back to this position, we were kind of looking at this queen take where I was, queen takes b7, but then it gets a little bit out of control. But by not being greedy, by just controlling everything, you're not, you're going for a more symmetrical structure, but you're not giving your opponent any chances. And now I just don't see how black will have any winning chances in, in this position. The bishop is really, really nice here. And um, you could say these these are maybe a little bit of a, um, a problem for white, but I just don't see it. I think, I think this is great play by Gukesh, and it's going to head to a draw, right? Yeah, I, I do think that as well. I mean, the only thing that I can see is that white shouldn't slide into too much passivity. And by that, like, may just basically take too many negative decisions, maybe make too many kind of trades that benefit black so for instance if you move the rook back to d3 and black goes rook d8 i wouldn't necessarily rush to trade off rooks because the only thing that i can see is that black could try to maneuver a rook to b5 but this is asking so much of the position and the knight to coming to d5 yeah but to try and you need white to really mm. acquiesce to that one i mean if, if you just think about the only weakness in the position that white has it's really the only slight weakness is the B3 pawn. So that, that, that's why you're trying to target your banker, right? Your rook. But even then, it's not a major problem. I mean, if the pawn was on A3, uh, they might as well shake hands now. But as the pawn is there, that's the only target Black's got to go for. But White White has the open file. So White's got, mm -hmm. you know, this. White's also got the more active rook. His rook is in the center. It can actually also start targeting things itself. And this is going to be a draw. I think we can move on. This this one, this one, unless something drastic happens, Gukesh is going to go through to the next round. Yep. And uh, let's go back to the bird's eye view. And there is still one game that we haven't checked out, and that's Nippon Miyashi against Vidit. And yesterday's encounter, that was a draw. How is it looking for Nippon Miyashi, who has the white pieces? So two fantastic players. Um, Nepo, of course, been in the World Championship final a couple of times now. Must be a little bit gutted that he didn't win it, you know, the last attempt around, but did it another. Um, I mean, I can't really call him an older player from India, can I? But he, he is, compared to some of the other guys, a little bit older, but a great player. Symmetrical position again. So pawn structures, there's no nothing that dynamic, but White's pieces. You know, Simon. Yeah. Something that is not symmetrical is the clock times. Yeah. Take a look at that. No problem. Actually, just over one hour. Oh. Whereas Vidit, just over fifteen minutes. Like what on earth happened here? Yeah, there's there's a massive time. Um, and if, if we look at the how many moves they played, okay, there's there's ten. Okay, now now Black has played a move. He's defending that pawn. There's ten moves to make i think until they get more time so that it should be safe he's got to make a move like you know every one and a half minutes so it should be all right but if it does get messy at any moment 
it, it could start getting quite risky. I mean, it, lo- it looks fairly even to me, Ivanka. I think Black can always start swapping off rooks. I mean, if anything, this pawn over here really helps Black's structure because B2 is a long-term weakness. And that pawn, you can't really ever move as white because they're on pass on. So is there any way white can attack knight f5? I just moved the king, right? It doesn't look scary. Yeah, it doesn't look scary. Um, I would be more tempted to put the knight on d5. Okay, so we go knight d5 here. Let's say I just centralize the rook, get ready to play c6. Mm. I want to obviously kick that knight away at the right time. Just wondering. Black... How to build from this a quick? I was thinking Queen F three. Yeah, Queen F three targeting there, and I think I'm going to be very solid as Black here, just huddled huddled up in this kind of position. And again, C six. As soon as I play C six, I exchange more pieces. Yeah. And maybe I pref slightly prefer Black and Queen D Queen D one. Queen D one, nice just move. Just to keep just to keep it going. And if I play C six, am I going to fall for a trick? Well, there is knight b6, and I am going to try and claim that. I was worried about There's a pawn. There's a pawn on a4. I was about to fall in my pocket. Okay, yeah. And now this pawn could even be could be weak, right? Okay, mm -hmm. maybe. I mean, uh, c6 is probably rushing it a little bit. I mean, I can also start using my knight. Um, yeah. I could come one of these two ways and attack. I, I like c5. This is a great square for Black's Knight because I defend my pawn and I attack the pawn. Fairly, it's got to be fairly even at the moment, this. Yeah, it has to be, right? Yeah. I mean, also very dynamic because if, say, in this type of position, white makes a bad move, yeah. like f3, mm -hmm. ugh, what a horrible move, then uh, knight b3 looks like it could be Oof. very, very annoying. I mean, Definitely. you kind of highlighted that pawn on a4, strength, weakness. Well, we'll find out. Yeah, I, I would say in the long run, black's black's probably better, right? Because in the long run, mm. black has this better pawn configuration. White's pawns, they're static, especially these two. They can't really move. You could say black's got a static pawn, but this really helps give black a, a nice hold here. And in the long run, the B2 pawn could be weak. So I don't think that it's in really any danger as of yet, except on the clock there. Now, I, I'm hearing maybe... Things are happening on Magnus's game, so I think we should probably jump back. And I'm not going to call him the world champion, even though I have done before. The strongest player in the world, or the legendary Magnus Carson. Um, should we have a look at how he's getting on? Definitely. And yeah, I'm just taking a look at the position. Oh, a lot's happening, and a lot is happening. And already, I can see that. Yeah, Magnus. It's just win this game. Well, maybe not win this game, but win the match for sure. Yeah. And the last time we looked was around here, and we we didn't like White's chances. And Magnus just played Queen A3, Ivanka, anyway. He played it straight mm. away, which looks like a good move, right? It certainly and does. As soon as the Queen's come off, Chucky goes to the ending. Only one side can be better. It's a side with the pass pawn. And Black's got a pass pawn, yeah, it's blockaded at the moment by the bishop. But White's pawns, they're just immobile. They're blockaded. So these pawns are kind of useless now when the queens come off. So Magnus now moves his bishop to a more active square. He now exchanges knights. And he does this just to make it simpler. He only needs a draw. So he goes to simplifications. Now, the question is d5. Well, d5 is just going to be met by c4, and black is quicker. So you can't play that. If you can't play that, it's bad news. You have to make more exchanges. And even if Magnus didn't have this pawn, I would give him favorite to draw, draw the position. But he does have that pawn. And Chucky, well, the more exchanges you get, the more closer to a draw. That's, a, that's an interesting move, moving the king. Allowing the exchange there, but Magnus is just going to hoover mode and he's just hoovering up everything. Uh, there they go, off the board. And well, okay. But this is a weird this move from Jackie as well, yeah. because the first thing that I'm looking at as a certified materialist, which takes. Oh, 
well, why not? You know, I mean, there's a pawn yeah, exactly. on three. I take and after king c4, bishop to e1. What? Just a pawn up, right? I mean, exactly. You can never lose as black unless you know you really. And and the thing is, this might be winning because the only way you can win back the pawn is by playing this. But then in the king and pawn ending, the white king is so far away, and the black king might just be able to. You know, this would be a race. So let let's say you did get this, Ivanka. It's very easy to count this kind of position. Uh, I mean, I will say the great way to try and prove your calculation is start with king and pawn endings. So we're going to cheat and we're going to say, OK, is black winning here, for example, with this allowing bishop takes b4? But then if you were trying to improve your calculation at home, you'd look at this position and you'd work it out without moving any pieces. And if you keep doing this process, you get better at visualizing and calculating. But we're, we're just sure because we cheat. Let's say you get this. It's very forcing that's why it's very easy to calculate and the black king i think we can see is just too quick right it's just going to gobble up and win the game so yeah so i think chucky's given up really a little bit here i don't know if we have the chucky cam is that him in the background yeah he he's is. in the background yeah. and uh I, I think he just forgot about the pawn on f2 and the thing is even but, even even in this i mean i i suppose even if you know that Chucky can draw, there's no way he can win this one. That's the point, right? I mean, yeah, he might have other moves, but. Yeah, and they've uh, passed does. move 40. Yeah. So I guess at the worst, Chucky could just offer a draw. Yeah. Yeah, and... I mean, I don't think you can easily win this pawn back, Ivanka. We've just shown one line where you can't win it back. So if, if Magnus needed to win this position, I think he'd have good chances, but. Magnus is going through to the next round. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that at all now. Yeah, and uh, I almost feel temp. Well, actually, I will cross out Ivanchuk on my notepad. And, oh, uh, I don't, I don't ever cross out Chucky. <laughs> oh, that you know, even when he goes out, you can't cross him off. I mean, no, that... I know, but that's the nature of the game. This is the, the is. kind of tournament where you lose, you make one bad decision. And that's it. You are going home on the first flight. Yeah, and... I mean, you can see the pain on his face looking at the camera. And this is uh, one of his usual poses. Uh, you know, he he um, does have the nose picker uh, with his fingers. I mean, the, but this is kind of his thinking pose. And you can see he's really rejected there. You know, it, it was really hard for him to come and uh, compete in this tournament. Actually, Magnus cut the, because obviously leaving Ukraine is not easy. Uh, for men of a certain age at the moment and he had to get special permission to leave ukraine and he had and he got actually a, a sort of a letter written signed by many chess players encouraging his government to to let him leave to be able to compete and one of the the main names on that letter saying that you know we want van to play in this event was magnus carlson you know um including many other top players but magnus carlson signed this letter really appreciating the strength of van right. Chuk, but he, he is going Simon, out. yeah, yeah, he is going to go out, but I mean, he can take solace that he's had a tremendous tournament so far. He beat Henriquez Villagra, he beat Wei Yi in the rapid, he beat Sanal Vihep in round four, and uh, there we see the king going to c4. This, this is it. Yeah, again, it's the same issue. Let's say I move my bishop back as it's attacked. You have to now again calculate can white take that pawn and uh, my, i my i don't think he can i think he's too slow and it, again this is a great bit of calculation in your head we can try doing it without moving the pieces now bishop takes pawn bishop takes king takes king 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 and black's too quickly black's winning that ending so you can't even take that pawn there and again, in a real game situation, you'd have to double check your calculations. But if, if you can't take the pawn, black is probably just winning as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Sad. And also, I just wanted to point out one technique that you can do as well. Don't just look at the direct path to the pawn. Have a look at the diagonals as well. Because if your king moves to the diagonal, it actually takes the same amount of squares. And you can do a technique called shouldering, where you can just push the defender king away. And there you can see Simon highlighting how to do it i'm just making yeah, some nice well... patterns on the board there. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, there we go this is the proper technique everyone should know this way of maneuvering 
Hmm, interesting. Okay. It's called the random technique. Black random would be fine. Pattern yeah. technique. Okay, shall we go back to the bird's eye view and have a look yeah, at definitely. some of the other games? Let's have a look. It's not just Basil who is facing elimination. Um, it was a very oh, interesting so game, exciting. a game we haven't been to. Salem's game seems to be this. I, let's let's go there. That's really interesting. White needs to win that one, and that's kind of heating up. I think uh, tactically. Shall we? Shall we pop over there? Let's let's go over there. Okay. So we had this position, and we were talking about uh, both sides' plans around here. And let's just remind everyone that Salem with the white pieces must win to take it to tie break. And he's gone for a reverse King's Indian. And we thought that was quite a good idea, keeping pieces on the board. And he did go for this plan of playing F4 by moving his knight out of the way. Standard idea. And we did get exactly the position we were predicting. The knight comes and annoys that pawn, but it's quite easy to deal with. Okay, you have to move your queen back, but it doesn't matter because you're going to play F4. Lots of moves being played, and this bishop can be good or bad, but here we see that white can't, he can't go for a draw. He has to go for the win, so he moves his rook. Black getting ready for the standard b5 idea and c5, getting counterplay on the queen side. This a5 idea, well, the computer doesn't like it, but it's a very logical idea. If that pawn moves, you take on pass on. Bishop comes back. Maybe this is why it's a mistake, because black can win a pawn. But that maybe doesn't matter, because you're going to attack on the king side, supporting the knight. Black now grabs this pawn. The rook comes back. And this is this is often what you get in the king's Indian. Black's, well, the guy, you know, the side with the big pawn in the center often is doing really well. But as soon as f4 comes, it gets really scary. So let's get to that position. Or is he even going to play f4? Let's have a look. Queen c7, bishop g4. Okay, there was a missed chance there, apparently. Not a big one. Bishop g5 was slightly better. Let's go back. a5, this pawn. It looks really scary, though. Bishop g5, and now rook e6. And okay. there is a chance for white, Yvanka, here. All of a sudden. White, oh, he missed it. He missed the best chance. This move, very logical, but it was a missed opportunity. White needing to win this game had, well, knight takes g7, apparently. And that, that was, that's the move that you are kind of inclined towards, especially if you see the computer evaluation bar shoot up like that. But uh, can we quickly check it out why that was so good? Knight takes g7. Yeah, so you take on G7, takes. and now you, you, you actually just play it quite simply. You take the rook, and here you have to open the position, and the reason is F4, and mm. suddenly Black's king is looking so bare here. I mean, this is, this is the computer says it's, it's good for white, but for a human, I think, to evaluate this would be really tough, right? Really, really tough. And uh, by the way, Simon, just to update you, Magnus Carlsen did defeat Vasil Ivanchuk. So that means Magnus is now through to the semi-finals. No, quarterfinals, so my apology. Yeah, well done, Magnus. He made it look pretty smooth, this match. Uh, Ivanchuk, uh, not on his top form, but um, great to see him playing here. And, and let's just hope he gets a chance to play many more tournaments, Ivanchuk, and we see him rolling but we had a look at that it did look like a van trick uh, was was getting knocked out there okay so this was going back to this game this was a missed chance for slim but his move also seems very logical he plays f4 let's forget about that dubious mark and this is a real race situation white's pieces they're all converging over on the black king but black has this simple and straightforward idea push and queen Push and queen right. the pawn. Push and queen the pawn, yeah. But there's a problem of checkmate or bad stuff yeah. happening to the black king. So the first question that I would be asking is like, what are the alternatives? What is white threatening? So if you do go pawn takes pawn, isn't knight takes g7 still a problem? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the big threat is knight takes g7, as you say, Yvanka. I mean, let's just say you, you played a4 as well, right? Just to show yeah. how strong it is here. 
now we've got another attacking unit. This is just completely devastating because if we do the same lines we do before, well, I'm not even sure if black can take this because after here, suddenly this knight has to move. When the knight moves, it also allows the white queen to come into the king side. That knight does a very good job of stopping the queen coming in. And I think just black is, can resign here. So you can't do that. That's the threat in the position. And black has to find out a way to do that. So Yvanka was just suggesting this could be a possibility. Well, not a possibility for the same. There's no and possibility. Again, same Maybe reason, the same, I think, yeah. Same reason, right? Knight takes pawn. And you, again, take the rook. And here, I think you want to hit the knight, make that knight move so the queen can come in. And if rook f8, I can start piling up on the f file, I assume. Yeah. Like this. Looks... So this is, this is a bit scary for black now. I think um, Salem has some good chances of leveling the match here. So if, just... Let's move. Just kind of thinking ahead, I mean, what can black play in order to neutralize white's attack? Yeah, we, we see that the evaluation bars are 50% even Stevens, but mm -mm, this looks wild. Is it knight takes bishop? Well, let's and say you go knight takes bishop. Swing. I mean, this, this is a move I wouldn't want to play as black just because I'm allowing, you know, I wouldn't even calculate. I'm just like allowing the queen in. And all of a sudden, I, I I would just look at this and I'd be like, I can't play that. I mean, if you mm -hmm. try to block with a rook, well, you know what's going to happen here. The h pawn's now going to come, right? Yeah. As always. And I just push. I mean, this, I don't know. This looks really scary. Big attack well, for white here. It is. It certainly looks like Avasov will be crossing that minefield. There's so much danger and poison in White's position. Well, we will see in a few minutes as we take a quick break whether he will be able to navigate that. But first, there is a very special event coming up on the horizon. Well, you've heard of Titles Tuesday, the weekly blitz events for title players like Hikaru, Magnus and other Super GM regulars. Now get ready for Untitled Tuesday. You heard that right. We're bringing Titled Tuesday to you. Put your blitz skills to the test and see how you fare. Anyone is eligible to play in weekly Untitled Tuesday tournaments. Use exclaim Untitled in chat to find out how. And with that, we'll refill our coffee cups and more action from the 2023 FIDE World Cup on the other side of this break. Today we're going to go down into the New York City subway, set up a table on the subway platform and see if we can get some strangers waiting for their trains to play chess with us. All right, now I'm going to see if I can get anybody. Hey. Uh, I'll be white. White. Yeah, Sounds like he knows what he's doing a little bit. Don't worry, I'm not that good. Yeah? You're just out here playing chess, not that good. You got the chess.com app. Do you ever play on your phone? Oh yeah. He said he barely played. I'm a teacher. What do you teach? Chess. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Self-defense. How do you stay sane? Uh, I used to do a lot of meditation. Take medication. <laughs> What's like lesson 101 of self-defense? Run. What are you listening to right now? Train. Sean Paul, Ed Sheeran. What is the meaning of life? It's funny because like what I'm doing, I feel like doesn't align with my philosophy on what the meaning of life is, but it's like obviously spend as much time with family as possible. Be the best person you can be, get closer to God, not to be evil to each other. There you go. Good game, thanks for playing. Ah, good, good game, game thanks brother. for playing. Appreciate it. I'll see you in a self-defense class. Enjoy Harry Styles. Chess grandmasters can lose 10 pounds and burn 6,000 calories just by sitting. Yeah, so I've actually been spending a lot of time getting in shape. Wow, that's great. What are you doing? Mostly like rook lifts. Oh, I've never heard of that. It's a thing. Don't look it up.
309 players, 206 men and 103 women are here for the 2023 FIDE World Cup. It's the premier knockout tournament in over-the-board chess. All of these players have one goal, to become a candidate for the World Championship. Only three players in each tournament will earn this distinction. The winners will also earn a combined 160 grand in US dollars. Not bad. Jan Shostov Duda, the reigning World Cup winner, is back to try and repeat as champion, a feat no one has ever achieved in this grueling tournament. And Jan Shostov Duda wins the 2021 FIDE World Cup. What a performance. The top remaining seeds in 2023 are Magnus Carlsen and Tan Zhongyi. Neither of them have won a World Cup before. Yes, even Magnus has yet to make it past the semis. It's that tough of a tournament. Still, Carlsen is the favorite in pretty much any tournament he plays. But don't sleep on the rest of this field. Fabiano Caruana, Jan Napomnishi, and Gukesh D. They are all here to try and win their first World Cup. For its part, the women's field also boasts some of the strongest players in the world. Who will take the throne this year? In a knockout like this, it is truly anyone's game. Who will come out on top? Who else will qualify for the candidates? What upsets are in store? This is the 2023 FIDE World Cup. Welcome back. We are right in the middle of all the action of round five, game two. The people could be going home. Every move will matter. And there we see the players in the playing hall. We already see some empty seats. Well, let's have a look at the bird's eye view and find out what exactly is happening and who is through to the semi quarterfinals and who will be going home. And already you can see two results. As we know, Magnus Carlsen defeating Ivanchuk with the black pieces, but also Gukash qualifying into the quarterfinals after that very solid draw against Wang Hao. It was a bit of an ask, right? To draw well, to win on demand with the black pieces for Wang Hao. Yeah, it certainly was. I mean, uh, Wang Hao's a very solid player, but I kind of think the match was pretty much over yesterday when he lost with the white pieces. That was a, a major, major win for Gukesh. And Gukesh is looking incredibly focused and strong in this event. And I wouldn't write him off to win the whole thing. You know, he, he's, he's one of the players who's, who's playing the best quality chess. If we have a look at the other boards and we'll have a deeper look at them later on, we can see the uh, top left um, next to Carlson's game, Duda versus Caruana. Still a very interesting position there. Uh, it's Knight versus one Bishop. Um, kind of looks like, I don't know whose king is weaker there. I still think White's king is a little bit weak, uh, but very interesting structure. Nepo versus Vidit in the top right. That Seems very balanced to me. I, I expect they'll be going to playoff. And uh, any other games you want to you want to sort of point out there, Ivanka? Yeah. And uh, one game that we haven't really checked up on, although we will def certainly look at it in more detail later on, is Alexei Serrano against Lenia Dominguez. Lenia Dominguez won in a very exciting game yesterday, and Serrano looking like he has a small advantage, but of course needs to nurture that one further if he wants to survive in the tournament and going to the uh, bottom right where we see Pragnananda and Burkes I don't know what's happening in that game <laughs> but uh, yesterday it was a draw between these two so anything can happen yeah I would say that Burkes's position I was gonna say it's got a bit better but Again, it's that king. We pointed out the safety of the king in these French defences. I mean, the black king is, it is in the middle. I think it's going to have to stay in the middle now. And I, I never really like leaving my king in the middle of the board because it gets in the way of the rooks. So actually, I, I think Prague has still got a nice edge there. Yeah. And there's absolute chaos in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, we were looking at that a minute ago. It's it, it, The computer says it's dead even. 
Um, but there's pieces flying everywhere. And the last uh, game, I think, Ivan Kerr is... Dead even. Sorry, Ivan Kerr, yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it's between Eric Isi and Grandelius. Grandelius also needing to win with the black pieces. That's looking like it's going to be a Herculean task. And uh, let's take a look at the bird's eye view of the women's games. And uh, let's uh, start from the top there with Harika against Gorishkina. Players drew yesterday. What's it looking like now? I think it's just going to be a draw, the top left game. Uh, they're in a rook and pawn ending. It looks like Black's rook is a little bit more active. So I think Harika has to be careful. But this is, I would have thought, a drawing technique. Checking the Black King. The Black King either has to lose protection of the pawn or go very passive. And uh, I expect it will be a draw. They're actually, very quickly, I, I don't think there's going to be much more play left. They could even repeat the position now. Next to that, you have um, Kostyanas Philly need to needing to win that game. Is that right? We, we yeah. had a look at that earlier. And, yeah, uh, it was again very complex. You know, White had that perfect Catalan bishop sitting on g2. She still has that bishop on the board, but somehow or other the play has fizzled out. And she, whilst White still does have that advantage, it's looking somewhat more comfortable for Black. Yeah, okay. Well, let, let, let's go to that game and we can look at it in a bit more detail. So this is a game where White must win um, because in the first match, um, Tam managed to get victory. And it is the two bishops. That, that's the good thing about the position. It was nice to have two bishops. But you often lose a lot of that advantage when one of those bishops is swapped off because the good thing about the two bishops is one bishop covers all the light squares and the other bishop controls all the dark squares. So they kind of control so many squares. And look at this. I'm going to paint the board again. I occasionally like getting the red paint out and just throwing it on the board. But when you lose one of those bishops, that, that advantage often goes. So my first thought, I'm black. I want to get rid of the advantage pair. Yeah, bishop c5. Okay, I mean, h6 first also makes sense. But at some point, bishop c5 would have been uh, my, my first thought. Just exchange one of them off. But then it's knight versus bishop. Not a big deal. Symmetrical pawn structure. Um, and that would have been the way I would have played. But h6 has, has been seen on the board. I mean, it's mm. still, there's still play for white. There's a lot of pieces left. But black in no trouble here. Would you, you think, or what do you reckon you reckon? Yeah, I, I'm not a big fan of this last move, h6. Hmm. Seems strange. Because I, uh, it does seem strange. And the first move that I'm thinking of is, well, why not put the rook on c6? Get motoring. Right. Improve the positioning of the rook, tying the knight down, and also threatening maybe to, to win a pawn. I like that move, just improving the pieces. Now, again, I really want to exchange this bishop off. I mean, I, I would have played this last move, but let, let's see. Can I do it now? Let's try it. And if you don't exchange, I'm going to argue that my bishop is trapping your rook. It's a bit better placed on this square. I might yeah, have um, also got knight d8 as a, as a horrible Yeah, move. I suddenly just saw that. It dawned on me that I might have done some bad things to my rook. Because I was thinking, oh, well, I just go bishop d2. Actually, yeah. bishop d2 could be still a move because after knight b8, the idea is to go b4. <clears throat> yeah. I saw that one in advance. It's getting a bit complicated, this one, for my liking. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, this is this is quite crazy because now if I take the rook, yeah, you pawn capture takes here, but you're attacking my knight and attacking that pawn. Yes, white is the exchange up, but even when you move the knight, even when you're maybe going to win a pawn, that is a monster of a pass pawn supported by one bishop. And, um, maybe black is okay, but white's got all the chances here. So I, I wouldn't want to go into this. No way. Not from this solid position I start with. So rook c6, an interesting idea. I mean, just putting a little bit of pressure on the position. Um, other things that white can do is maybe improve your bad pieces. Yeah. So this rook is not doing anything. Maybe bring that to an open file. You can't go wrong by improving your pieces. The that makes is, a lot of sense, Simon. It does. I mean, the Sorry. thing is, a lot of it's about timing, isn't it, Ivanka, I guess? And you've got time here. Yeah, you certainly do have time. And uh, I just kind of wanted to point out that Rook to D1 actually is the move that you probably should be thinking about playing 
immediately because there's a little rule and it's quite a static rule so you've got to be flexible about it but basically it says when it comes to choosing which piece to improve choose the one with the most value and the rook is worth five in, yep. you know choose that one first over a bishop over the king yeah why, why not move it to an open file and uh, mm. i mean a good a good if you, if you want a little hint at home when you can do these kind of slower maneuvers it's you look at your last your opponent's last move and chess is really about timing you know if your opponent plays a move like h6 it's quite clear that h6 is not going to threaten a, a big checkmate attack it's a threat it's just a small slow way to try and prove the position by getting that pawn off a vulnerable square and then you know you have time to maneuver in a slow fashion so a, a move like rook d1 is certainly playable after a move like h6 here i, I mean it, i guess this is equal but it's more equal for white right that's that's what i'd say I, i'd say white has a slight advantage um uh, i should, agree should we move on to try should and find a we... game with a bit more action right let's go back to the bird's eye view because we still have some players in a must win situation and i think that the game between elizabeth pates and muzzy trick the the third game is gonna end in a draw if i've done my math right and i think the real action is happening in the game shivalova against salimova remember shivalova oh. is in a must win situation and there is a black pawn on a3 that excites me no end yeah so uh what's happening here okay well let's have a look so we, we had this position before and, and black's opening to my eyes looked really risky especially in a in a position where you only need to get a draw and you give white all this activity so brave play from black but now white maybe doesn't take the opportunity to open things up so the game continued bishop g5 and we're just whiz through the moves very very quickly bishop e7 white castling quickly and here comes what was it the draft attack no the noah's ark the noah's ark <laughs> but, <laughs> but what is this because now c well c4 occurs and the, and there there is a noah's noah's ark trap but on the downside d5 is very weak so white comes in to d5 oh no he doesn't no she doesn't why didn't she go why hmm. didn't she just go queen d5 here and just i don't that know one? pawn takes maybe she was afraid that her queen would get trapped maybe okay we'll, we'll move on because that that looked like a, uh the critical move white sacrifices a piece instead but this is also quite tempting because you stop black from castling and you get three pawns for the piece very sharp position Ivanka. just the kind of position you want if you need to win but this is a great idea from black opening up the rook lovely play white trying to keep the queen side closed and why not a3 there a3 would be the logical way to continue just trying to keep it open and just shove it shove it down the board <laughs> sophisticated simon <laughs> shove it against shove all over and now e5 comes and it's still a mess isn't it a3 there you go it's coming b3 and this is this is where we are i mean i'm just trying to work it out bishop takes d6 played and i'm assuming white has to keep the queens on the board right yeah you have to otherwise the pawn on b4 will fall and let's not forget yeah. that the runaway pawn it's still an operation on a3 it is a runaway so pawn. you have to go you, you have to go e takes d6 yeah so what's the time situation so why oh, you could move the queen sorry yeah go on oh, queen, yeah move the queen and try to take with the rook yeah that's that's rook, flash. yeah i suppose the logical move though is something like this and we can try to like work out what is happening here i mean equal on material but it kind of looks like the white king is in more danger than the black king and in these double-edged positions it's it's often about king safety and i say that because Black's got some attacking chances with this A-pawn. Um, really complex situation. And may maybe also Queen F6, right? Let's do that. I, I always like threatening checkmate in one move because you never know, Yvanka. That one day, you might fall. You might fall for it. Who knows? Like, <laughs> and it's a good now. improving move as well. I mean, there's also that. So it fulfills both criteria. And the question is how to defend. 
you don't want to be going 94 you after all like is material up so you've mm. got to go c4 or yeah c4 Ooh, c4 though but uh, more space nasty no no a2 is happening oh but it's a no, lovely no, no, no. checkmate no no, no yeah. take 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 <laughs> we've got to show the mistake. checkmate we've got to show the check <laughs> okay, i'm sorry yeah, yeah. Ivanka. but we got to show it right yeah yeah go for it because suddenly these these pieces combine beautifully mm -hmm. and it's a nice it's a nice idea it's a, you know if you could get one more or two couple more moves in maybe it's okay but you, this one isn't it it's a big check yeah king comes here and bang that is really nice so have to take it, it. don't defend b2 anymore so dangerous to white uh, i i i don't think polina is i think black's doing very well here right i mean it's really complicated so that's the advantage and polina does have a big time advantage but she's having a long think here because she, she's probably realized that if you take with a pawn queen f6 is really scary does it help to go c3 Ivanka? though because that's a no is it the same oh no you just drop no, b3 i think it's the same thing right yeah, maybe maybe the same thing oh yeah bishop takes b3 that's why i, I ended up with c4 yeah. So uh, that means you have to block it with knight e5. And <laughs> and if you that is... have to block it with knight e5, well, I, I can simply just take that and win take a pawn, it. can't I? Right, yeah. exactly. And the more pawns you win or the more pieces that yeah. get traded off, then the more that extra bishop is going to start to count. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it, it looks very good for black here. Very exciting position, this one um Polina trying everything i mean it's still i i i still think this could go either way because it's only moved 19. look at the time you're going to get nervous if you know you're just very close to qualifying i mean this is where you you have to try and keep your cool uh, and still open to many things lots of action occurring on that board and that leaves us i think with one was it one other game we haven't looked at? In, in yeah, the but that looked, it was between uh, Elizabeth Pates and uh, Anna Mozichuk. But that game, if we go back to it very, very briefly, it looks like it was just going to be headed into draw. quite a straightforward draw. But of course, I actually think that Black is the only one that is slightly better there on account of those past pawns there on the Queen side. Yeah, so this is the ending we have, and um, which you can just have a very quick look at it, Elizabeth Pats versus Anna Muzichuk. And uh, as Ivanka says, it does look very much like a draw. It's this equal material in the ending. But, uh, you, you know, these, these queenside pass pawns, are, they can be a little bit of an issue um, if your king can't get to the centre in time. But I think the white king is now ready to motor in. And another, another thing in white's favour is the pawn on f5. The pawn on f5 is stuck on a light square. So it's always going to be a target for this bishop. Uh, you don't want yeah. to put your pawns in the same color square as the bishops in the ending because they'd just be targets. Right. So it should, should be a draw, but it'll... Yeah, you know, it, there's only one tiny line that I want to show. Yeah. For instance, what does have to be a little bit careful, say, for instance, you go king f2. Yeah. And Anna's uh, idea is pawn takes pawn. Yeah. And if you go bishop takes pawn, the idea is to go bishop e6. Mm -hmm. And that is the danger that i was talking about when yeah. i was referring to Definitely. past pawns and pawns on the queen side yeah good spot you van because this is uh, i mean it is the outside pass pawn when, when is it the most strongest and it's the most strongest in a king and pawn ending and if you did exchange bishops here if lizzie did go for this this potential to get a pawn here the reason it's so strong is that the white king has to be drawn all the way to stop that pawn and what does that do it leaves the other side of the board vulnerable so the black king can come in there and that, that's just standard technique to to win those positions so it seems it seems like there's a little bit of danger actually I, I think for white here even though it should be a draw this configuration over here it's like okay you got to be careful and lizzie it looked like she wasn't sure about she, she went to move a piece there but she changed her mind I think it's some moment. It looked like there, she so. was going to go for a3 or pawn takes pawn. Well, yeah. we are still expecting this one to finish in a draw. But uh, let's go back to the bird's eye view in the open section. We have uh, still six games outstanding and a lot of drama. Where do you want to head to first, Simon? 
Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of drama brewing. I mean, looking at the positions, they're, they're getting quite interesting. I mean, is, I'm just going to... Is Vidit, like, down to 10 seconds? Is Vidit there on the top right? It's down to 10 seconds, but it, it seems like quite a boring boringish position. I mean, I think he'll be okay on time. We can see his time ticking down. Ah, he might okay. have just made the time trial. I can also see, if we look at Eregaisi versus Grandilius, it, it seems mm -hmm. like black is a pawn up, but it's a dead draw, um, opposite color bishop. So it looks like Eregaisi, another one of the Indian players, is going to be going through. We did say we'd have a look at the one game we haven't looked at. Maybe we should catch that one up, Sar Sarana versus Dominguez. We can quickly yeah. go there and just see how, how things are going. But I I yeah. just kind of also want to check sure. up on the big matchup between uh, Jan Krzysztof Duda and Fabiana Caruana because I'm looking at the bar. I'm always determined by the bar. That's always guides okay. where I should go to because look at it. It's all the way on Fabiana's side. Right. Okay. Wow. So let's go there. And um, it was very exciting. And we had this position where the white king was looking a little bit exposed, all about king safety in chess. And we saw rook c8 played, but now white playing bishop e3. It looks like a normal square, but it's going to be a target for the black knight. f5, the move we very much liked, and also a target for the black pawn. f3, the knight now comes in. Very aggressive play from Fabi. Bishop takes here a mistake. Look at the white king. It's getting opened up. Things have gone really wrong for Duda here. Capture on e4. And now the capture on e4 again. And the current position is queen d5 on the board. Whoever wins this game, if we do have a winner, that is, they go through to the next round. They've both got a enough time off, but look at the light square domination by black pieces in the middle of the board. There is going to be some kind of threat of e3 with the queen being released and also you've got to watch out for the knight moving and the rook being released lovely centralization right looks really good for black this position Yvanka. it does look optically fantastic for black but i'm just wondering like what is the move to kind of secure that material advantage well i think um i want to move the we knight see, we right? see him reaching uh, he's just was he played king g3 King g3 okay so king g3 that was the move that i wanted to play and i can see the evaluation bar was like yeah, uh, I mean, uh, 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 just look at good. the kings Yvanka. i mean the, the white king is so exposed but the black king is really safe these two pawns are actually just blockading it right it's great these right. pawns you'll never be able to take the black king but the white king is just too exposed i mean uh, you're thinking how does black improve i was thinking maybe you guard the rook somehow so the knight can move like I could go rook c6, just improve, very simple move to play. And now my knight has more options, like knight e5. You can't take the rook. Just improve slowly like this. Yeah. And I guess you do you have ideas of g5, or is that unnecessary? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Why not? g5, trying to get rid of the bishop. Good move. Um, I mean, the other thing you could do is maybe now move the rook to f8 and threaten g5. Mm because that's another way your knight can move. Okay, you move your rook away from the queen, but maybe that wasn't too powerful. And this idea of g5, using that pin, you, 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 yeah, it could be really strong. Mm. Yeah. So, looking tough. good for Fabiano. Really tough. And Fabiano does have the time advantage, so we can now think about the position, and he doesn't have to rush into making a big, a big choice here. Um, I mean, you can go wrong as black here yeah? if you try to force it too quickly. Like, I don't think e3 works because white just takes it, you know? I mean, you, you've got to build up. And I think moving the rook here makes sense because these three pieces are so idyllic at the moment. The totally. And pawn. also makes a lot of sense, right? The rook on c8 isn't doing anything other than just guarding the pawn, the knight on c4. So improve it, yeah. rook to f8. Rook to f8. It carries with it. Yeah. Some threats. Definitely. Uh, and the simpler move is rook c6, right? Because you, you just guard it in a really safe way. So if you want to be lazy, rook c6. But if you if you spot now that there's this pin, then this this looks you might as well you want to create threats, right, Ivanka? And rook rook mm -hmm. f8 creates a much bigger threat than rook c6. 
creates the simple and strong threat of G5. And at this level, it's just the kind of move that they, they will spot nearly immediately. So right. really good chance for Fabiano to, to go through to the next round. Totally. And just kind of... A just to kind of see like g5 is obviously the main threat but if you were to go something like rook f2 uh -huh. i'm just i'm just seeing I'm what, how bad it is it always yeah, trying to get this one to work okay though. so if you do go e i couldn't quite see it working although i could be wrong yeah i mean you've always got to watch out for e3 but obviously you have to play bishop takes and there's is there a follow-up there um I can't see it. I mean, you, you can try to get your queen in. You can go queen. So, I mean, e3, e3 the, the move that Black's going to watch out for. Why, why are you... you oh, might wow. Think... So, e3 is actually, if you look at the bar, yeah, it's saying this is it's the killer move. move. So, bishop takes pawn. Bishop takes pawn. And now my first thought was that, you know, I've opened up the way for the queen, but I can't see a way that that's going to win. It, it might. I mean, there's, there's some nice lines here. I just showed them. I don't think this is the move. But let's say you took the knight. And this move is really funny because if you block <laughs> the rook, I take here. And I was thinking, can white get away with this move? But I think just rook takes f2, and that king is going to get checkmated. Let's just show the checkmate. If white takes it, the king runs into this one. And again, it's the king's safety in all these lines. White's king is so unsecured. That line didn't work, but we can show it again. So here, here f2 bishop takes and i think the reason this didn't work queen h1 is that white just goes rook takes rook takes rook right you don't get involved with the knight you take that one and black doesn't have enough pieces so where is the killer blow after bishop takes e3 and there is a killer blow here wow it's a nice move anyone in the chat find the killer blow black to play we've done this fearmatic pawn sacrifice but it's one of the hardest moves in chess it's a retreating Retreating is it attack? knight move. Oh, yeah. knight to d6. It is. Yeah, one of the hardest moves in chess is the retreating knight move. Uh, because you don't always look at your knights going backwards, but with a knight coming here, that is a major fork. Yeah, forking the king, rook, and queen. There's nothing that white can do about that. Uh, in this Beautiful. Position. Just winning a lot of what material. A move. Yeah, in the position. Okay. So. Okay, but. Knight d6, how easy is that to spot in the calculations? Because once it's on the board, I think you can see it quite easily. Yeah. I don't think it's that easy. I don't think it's that no. easy to, to, to find this one. I mean, they are hard moves to spot, but I suppose, you know, you, you, you'd probably find rook f8, and then after, like, rook f2, you, you'd have another thing. I think you would find e3 because it's, like, literally, that's a move you really want to play. Yeah. Yeah. You just want to release the queen, get some uh, pieces towards the white king. But knight d6 for me, is that an easy spot? It's not an easy spot by any means. I mean, let's say you go rook f8, rook here. I mean, maybe the way you spot it is you start looking at like knight d6 moves here with the idea of playing e3. You've just got to look at that. You've got to spot the e4 square for the knight where you've already got a piece on. So I don't think it's easy at all. I think that's a hard spot e3 here. I expect Fabi will find it because he's a he's like a you know a superstar, right? <laughs> and he you know he's Fabi. He's you know he'll find it. Fabi will find it. Okay, should we have a little bet, Yvanka? I first of all, I reckon he will play Rook F8. Has he played it yet? Okay, no, he hasn't. So he hasn't. He hasn't okay. played it just yet. But I reckon he'll find. Rook I reckon F8. he will find it. You reckon as well, yeah? Yeah. Okay. But okay, but that doesn't make an exciting bet. So I'm going to say. I'm going to say he won't go, I think he'll go rook f8, but you might not go e3. We have another result as well. Um, oh. you know, if we bring up the bird's eye view again, um, and we didn't get a chance to look at this, but it does mean uh, that we have another, uh, well, the Mingus has gone through, right? We, uh, he's yeah, drawn he's gone through to the quarterfinals. Yeah, yeah. Dominguez uh, beats Serrana in quite a spectacular game. I recommend everyone go and check it out. There were intermediate moves. There were like all these tactical tricks galore. And here, this position is level and a draw was agreed there in the bottom left corner. That means, as you said it, 
Dominguez goes through. He's play incidentally, he's playing in the World Rapid uh, Team Championships. And the same team that I'm playing in. Um, Simon, can you guess what we're called? Um, the Dominguez Fan Club. It's not very original, is it? I, I um, the I don't know. I, I could. I'll, I could I'll, put, I'll put you right. out of your misery. Yeah, misery. Chess pensioners. Chess pensioners. <laughs> wow. Is that what you consider yourself to be now? A chess pensioner. Well, apparently so. Who's in your team? Oh, it's very strong. It's like Vladimir Kramnik, Peter Svidler, oh, Dominguez. Oh, I like that. I like that. <laughs> Me. On, I don't know why I'm doing talk, that. Talk about, talk about name dropping. I mean, I know. Are, are I know. You? When I got the invite, I was like, yeah, just, just go. I don't care. And uh, there you see Dominguez eliminates Serrana. So big news. Dominguez playing fantastic chess, moves on to the quarterfinals. And uh, looking at the bird's eye view, still a lot of games in progress. And once again, I'm gonna, can I let my choices be determined by the evaluation bar? I'm looking at Pragnananda. The evaluation bar seems to be all the way in his favor. And uh, when it comes to the local hero, Abasov, the evaluation bar also seems to be favoring him. Yeah, when, I, can you still hear me at the moment? Okay. Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, yes, we might. Yeah, we, we can go there in a minute. I'm just uh, struggling a little bit to get the game up, but it does look um, like there's some exciting games still going on with um, Prague attacking there, and uh, this is a great view to bird's eye view. And he, he has played rook f8, by the way. Arowana wow. has played rook f8 there in the position. Well, and, no and if there. he finds that beautiful sequence of moves, well, Fabiano Caruana could be on the cusp of qualifying into the quarterfinals and uh, we're going to take a very short break and we'll be back with you in just a few minutes ready with all the action so don't go anywhere interested in becoming a chess streamer like your favorite creators such as hikaru gotham chess and the botan sisters come on look at this Woo! The Chess.com Community Streamer Program is growing every day. Whether you're just getting started with streaming or already established and looking to expand your audience, you can now connect your account to Chess.com and have your stream promoted on the game's largest platform. Simply link your account at Chess.com slash settings slash connected accounts, set your category to Chess on Twitch, and start streaming. You'll get an ad-free experience on Chess.com. You will pop up on our list of live streamers. Your Chess.com profile will feature your Twitch stream. And your stream will be linked to your games on our play server. Type Command Community Streamer in chat and start growing your stream today. Looking for a new way to learn chess? Meet Dr. Wolf, the ideal chess coach and companion. Play against Dr. Wolf as he explains everything step by step, points out strategic ideas, and alerts you to your mistakes. Train with him and go over your past mistakes until you master them. Choose from over 35 lessons created for all skill levels. No matter your level, everyone could use a coach. Download Learn Chess with Dr. Wolf for Android or iOS devices today.
and we are back and it's been a rip roaring day of game two in the round five and there we can see the bird's eye view and we also see another result it was a draw between Eragaisi and Grandelius and this means because Grandelius lost yesterday he is out and another Indian superstar, Eragaisi, goes through to the quarterfinals. Eragaisi, he is such a classy player. Excellently so far, we have Gukesh, Eragaisi. You have this kind of uh, uh, amazing, I'm going to say trio of the younger players, including Prague, but then uh, Vidit is slightly older. Um, it looks really positive for all of them at this moment in time. Uh, maybe we should go Prague's game and have a look there. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, we can see the evaluation bar all over in Pragnanda's favor. And there we see Pragnanda. And it looks like he will be headed to the quarterfinals, but it certainly wasn't easy. The round before this, he had to play a heavy, heavy hitter. A day after his 18th birthday, Pragnananda eliminates Hikaru Nakamura from the World Cup. In Game 1 of the rapid tiebreaks with the Black Pieces, Pragnananda found the critical G5, leaving Hikaru's knight with no safe squares. Hikaru played a few in-between moves, parrying the attack with another attack, but Pragnananda patiently waited for the perfect time to capture the knight. Hikaru's pieces had some initiative, but his offense quickly turned to defense as Prague's pieces coordinated their own attack. By move 33, Prague was up five points of material and no weaknesses in his position, prompting Hikaru to resign. Game 2 was a must-win situation for Hikaru and he played the King's Indian defense with the black pieces. Proving once again that knights on the rim are dim, Hikaru's knight was attacked on h5, and while it escaped this time, it came at the cost of some deadly tactics along the 7th rank. Prague achieved a dominant enough position for Hikaru to resign, earning Prague a congratulations from Magnus Carlsen. And there we saw in the video Prague with a big smile after defeating Hikaru Nakamura. Well, he is now in action against Berches from Hungary. And will he also leave this game with a big smile as the evaluation, set, but the evaluation bar certainly favors his position? So let's dive in, Simon, because this position is crazy. It is crazy, but the, the problem that Black's had from an early, early stage is one of the most, well, one of the, one of the three things you need to sort out and move one, your king. You need to get developed, you need to control the center, and you need to get your king safe. And the Black King just hasn't managed to do that. It's still in the center of the board. If you could get it over there, well, it'd be a lot more secure. But with the last move, Prague is opening up the position, and uh, it looks to me because he's got his two rooks ready to, at some point, shoot in, maybe with a sacrifice first on c6. This is, I, I don't know, I was going to say game over, but it looks really scary for Black now. Uh, Black has gone a pawn up by grabbing a pawn over here, but what does he play? Bishop takes knight has happened. He's got to win that back. So there's two, there's two possible ways to capture that one. And just to show you how weak the king is, if you take... With the d-pawn, yeah, it looks, oh, there's a, there's a checkmate threat. But in this kind of position, this is where you just get rid of the bishop. And I'm sure this position will now collapse with the queen coming in and the rook coming in. You have to take this one back here. And now let's bring the rook in with a check. Where does the king go? Let's say it goes to d, d7. And now you just need to find the killer blow here. And probably a move like opening up the position more with d5 is it maybe we go queen f3 first but let's try d5 and uh, black's position is just crumbling and crumbling for example you take on d5 and now queen f3 and the queen will enter and the black king is just going to die it's just going down <laughs> um so you that's what like happens one of my nieces there simon it's, it's just going to die just going to die just going to die nothing exactly. else to be done too weak. No, it's too no, weak. It's out there in the open. Yeah. Should never be exposed like that. And I love that line. And it's also super thematic as well. You mark my words after if D takes C4 appears on the board, 
rotates, bishop will happen instantly. So this kind of begs the question, you know, you have to recapture what's going to happen on the other capture, b takes c4. I expect the same thing, Ivanka. I mean, if you take here, I think it's the same idea of giving up the exchange and getting a rook to the back rank. So you need to get rid of these two defenders of, of that square. This might not be quite as strong because we don't have the central break opening things up, but it's still the same concept. That I come down here with check. You have to move your king. I mean, I don't think it helps putting it on this square. That looks just as bad. Um, and when you move your king, okay, I can't break here, but let's say I try another idea. Let's say I might even have knight takes d5, right? But let, let's go queen f3 wow. first because queen f7 is massive. You defend it, for example. Oh. And now another not, break not there. on the same square. The, well, the materialist in me is going, take the bishop. Well, you could take the bishop, but the checkmate in me yeah. is saying checkmate. <laughs> <laughs> so you, I mean, you, you take, taking the no. bishop, taking the bishop is, is, is yeah, probably, probably is, stronger. You're right. Yeah. No, 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 no. Her nine taste pawn is also killing it as well. So yeah. it just goes to show. Okay, so you can't do that. So say you go... Queen to e7. The queen is, after all, one of the best defenders there is. Yeah, I mean, I think Put I'm still going to do the same thing. I'll take, take on d5 take. always. And then, oh, this is a beautiful point that after pawn takes knight. You probably have to play this because otherwise my knight is coming in. And then I have, at the moment, two rook major a7 pieces. Check. Yeah, rook king a7. has to move. Rook a7 is the easiest bit way, isn't it? Just pick up bada king. bing, bada boom. Oh. You can pick that one up as well. Everything drops. It's it's completely losing for, for black. And if you can't do that, there is maybe one more move you could consider. Bishop takes b4, but I just don't believe that move can... Well, throw, throw it in. Work. Desperate times call for desperate measures. I mean, at least Let's this way, you black is now oh, nearly casting. He's What's made he a decision. What has he played? Back to the game. Let's see. He has... He's, he's taken with a b-pawn. So will Prague... I, I reckon it will take him... One second, no, okay, 30 uh, seconds. To 100%. Take that one. Prague is all about calculation, you yeah. know. He's, gonna he's all about those tactical opportunities. He's going to take on c6. Definitely. He's going to play queen f3, knight. This is like, I was going to say Charles play. <laughs> but Prague is now 18, so I'm allowed to say that. Charles play, good movie. Um, mm. Rook take, yeah, he is. He's not a child. How is he? How old is he? He's 18 now. 18, okay. Yeah, it's not really a child, is it? 18? No, not. No. Okay. And how, just out of interest, you know, we have the other Indian players in this round. I, I'm not sure about their ages, but uh, Erigaisi is, is they're, they're all similar ages, aren't they? I, 20. I, I think Erigaisi is 20. Uh, and okay. Gukash is 17, but to kind of as in just turned 17 yeah. in June. And yeah. Vidit is veteran. Yes, I don't know, 25 or something like that. He's far too old to you know for this for this game. Um, the the thing that amazed me about Prague, though, I've seen him in this situation so many times before, right? That he's um in a big big tournament, and he probably realizes now that Rook takes Bishop is going to get him through to the next round. But he's so composed, and this is another real strength of all the players I've seen from India. Just their composure is is fantastic, you know. He probably realizes he's winning, but he's double checking his, his calculation. He's not rushing. He's taking his time. I don't know what he's feeling inside. Maybe he's incredibly nervous inside, but he's just, he, he looks very composed when he plays, right? And the winning move that, well, the move we think is winning is just Rook takes C6. I'll be, I'll, I just can't see him playing any other move here. It's so right. aggressive and natural to get the Rook in to A8 and force that idea. We can show it one more time, Ivanka. Let's just go yeah, through let's, it. Yeah, uh, let's go through it. Rook takes bishop. You have to take the rook. He's he's calculating it right now. Rook goes to a8, check. And you can... King has to move to d7. I mean, it's not like you can hide anywhere on the king side. So yeah. step forward. I mean, if you went to e7 with the idea of going bishop g7 next move, um, is this is this another way you could potentially try well, I'm, I'm thinking you can go b5 as well yeah b5 and queen f3 is always the killer move the queen isn't f3. It? i love this queen f3 because you you, you threaten these yeah these it's it. happened there you go straight away and we see that um 
Lopez has replayed it straight away. Prague now getting ready to throw the rook in. Let's keep with the game. He's played rook takes c6. Rook takes. He's moved his rook into a8. He's on the verge of going through. And did he move the rook in? Yes, I think he has, hasn't he? Or is he taking his time with that? No, yeah, he's moved it in. Yeah, he's he's played rook a8. He did hesitate for a split second. Yeah. But, uh, and you could just see the confidence with every move that he played. And Berkes, well, he does have just over seven minutes, but nothing will help him now. There we see the shake of the head. What is he going to play? Yeah. He's had a great tournament. He's gone so far for his rating and, and got a nice pay packet. But it looks like uh, the underdogs run, Berkez's run, is going to run out now. Um, his king is just too weak. And it has been the problem right from the start. I mean, wherever you go with a king, I think queen f3 is the simplest winning move. I mean, let's again have a look at these lines. You've only got two squares. If you go here, Yuvanka was recommending b5. I really like b5, actually. Why not just threaten the rook first? Let's say you go rook f6, rook b6, sorry. This queen f3. This looks key. The big threat is actually rook a7. And queen takes f7 now. So bishop g7 might seem like it holds. But also you've got bishop a3 check. Oh, yeah. that's another massive move. Which way did he go with the king? Let's he, have... he went to king d7. It didn't make any logical sense to try king e7. No. And now the big question is, uh, will Prague find queen f3? It's a forcing move. He'll find it's it. a very natural move. I think he will find it. Um, hang on a second. I just want to point out your yeah, queen f3 played. Played it but straight just away. Having yeah. a look, there were that was the only winning move. Yeah, that's that's you know queen f3 is not shows his class. It shows his class. I suppose. I suppose the you know we've looked at many ways that black can try to defend this and. It doesn't seem like much is working against these two main threats, but how about how about f5? Because at least this way, I I, I say create a threat, but I do create a mini idea of trying to get the queens off the board. And as black, I'd love to swap the queens off because the white queen coming into this square is always a killer. So knight takes d5 doesn't work now because a queen takes g4, and it's game on. At least at least black has some chances in this position. So f5 might be at least against queen of freeze play queen of freeze we know f5 might be the best chance here to to keep the yeah. game going is there what what do we do against this one f5 yeah i mean if you just uh, grab the pawn by playing the en passant streamer move no 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 streamer move isn't it en passant okay okay um right yep so uh i, I don't know we'll see what's happening here rook Queen f3 played um, on the board. We've just seen if f5 is, is coming or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Prague, it looks like he's going to be doing the job here um, and going through to the next round. Uh, yeah. So great play so far. But I mean, it's getting very tense here. The game, the times are ticking down. We don't see any great defensive moves for black here maybe f5 is best but as as you yovi pointed out you can just take on f5 there might be other moves b5 is always an option when black has to put his rook on a bad square using that pawn to come through uh, but f5 taking on f5 followed by knight takes d5 looks like uh, um right. the main choice right to play yeah uh, so definitely Prague doing a, a difficult great job. position for burkes impossible yeah. position f5 probably the best Best idea. Now we see Burgess, complete concentration. Yeah, and he's got to move soon. He's down to four minutes 30. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Is that what's the. Oh, you, you said on pass on as well. I forgot about on pass yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> what's that rule? You allowed to do that on pass on. But it might not be the best move, actually, because maybe you have some ideas mm. of Bishop coming out. To d6 or something. Yeah, but Maybe. still, there's just one check. What's on pass on? One check does not, does, this is an old fashioned rule that only streamers use. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really a streamer anymore. So <laughs> I, I don't know, I don't know that rule anymore. I heard a funny story just while we wait 
for black to move. I expect this F5, I can't see anything else to create problems apart from F5. Um, I heard that like Mickey Adams, like probably England's greatest ever chess player, um, forgot about the on-passing rule and lost to another grandmaster, Neil MacDonald. Um, and I think he forgot about it twice in two separate games. So, you know, 10 years apart, he just forgotten the ending. That on pass on still works in the ending. It's one of those weird ones where if you're in the zone, you can sort of have a mind slip and just forget. I had a similar one, Juvenka. I was playing a, a junior about 2250 in the British Championships and we're in the opening and I put him in check and uh, I was really proud of myself because I liked my position. He castled. And then I was like, oh my God, my position is so bad. And I'm like, what have I done? And I sat there really confused for about 20 minutes. I, I'm sure I didn't calculate this. And then I realized, hang on a minute, I just checked him and he castled. <laughs> and the, the cheeky little player, you know, he, he castled in check. And I pointed it out and immediately he knew. He knew what he did because he's like, oh, yeah. And he moved it back and immediately he, he then blocked my check with a pawn. So he knew what was going on. And I thought, oh, okay, right. Oh, God, yeah, I, I did look at this move. And then I continued with the game. But I actually no, then realized I could have made him move his king. <laughs> is, is that right because he, he castled yeah because he castled he touched oh. yeah he touched the move piece you got oh, to know. move the piece so he completely hustled me basically Ivanka, by yeah. by like you know castling and then and then you know not even moving his king just just discombobulated me all over the shop so and um, talking about discombobulation Bakesh his position is completely discombobulated against Pragnananda Queen takes pawn, a big threat. Knight takes d5, is a potential killer. Oh, we have another result there in the background. Was that was that result or Salem I saw getting up? I don't know if we get a bit more information, if there's any other um, results. Yeah, we have through. a result. We have yeah. a result between Nepomniashi and Vidit. Yeah. That game in ended in a draw, which means tomorrow we'll be seeing some tie breaks. It looked like it was going to be a draw. People asking if I won that game. Luckily, I did win that game. F5 on the board now. Uh, luckily, yeah, uh, the, the kid. I, I taught the kid a lesson after that, but he just confused. He just confused me so much. British Championships and castling in check. That, that way to confuse. That way to confuse a grandmaster. It's interesting, Simon, because I think it's. Yeah. Nid it, uh, sorry, Nid it, Nepomniashi and Vidit. That's the only time I like what you did there. Sorry, Ivanka. <laughs> Nid it. You put them together <laughs> and you create a monster. You create the Nid it monster. Oh my <laughs> words. The chess playing monster from Russia, India, the Nid it. I love what you did. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, Ivanka. <laughs> no, I'm, I, 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 have it, I have the result here. And so I was looking at Nepomniashi and then somehow yeah. my brain meshed the two. And F5 on the board and Okay, so big questions here for Pragnananda. He cannot play knight takes pawn. That would be a mistake. He can play pawn takes pawn, g takes f5. He can also go b5, so he's going to be considering all the forcing moves. And they are only on move 29. So there is some time travel to consider. Players will, of course, be getting bonus time once they pass move 40. It will be 30 minutes increment. And there we can see... Also on the screen that uh, Nidit uh, Abbasov has eliminated Salem. So Azerbaijani player, local hopes, moves on to the quarterfinals. And in the quarterfinals, we're already going to see some big matchups. We're going to see Magnus Carlsen face off against Gukash. That one's going to be super exciting. Magnus Carlsen versus Gukash. Wow. That's, that's a yeah. big one. I, you know what? I mean, if Magnus doesn't bring his A game there, you know, this Gukesh is playing so well. I think he's playing the best chess out of everyone, Gukesh, at the moment. Doesn't make mistakes. And, it's, you know, that's going to be a big one. Really big match. They're all big. Totally. That's super match, that one. I mean, Gukesh has uh, beaten Magnus before. So I'm looking forward to that one. Can't wait for that. And talking about can't wait, we can't wait to see what Pragnananda plays in this position. He's got what so many. He's got so many good moves, hasn't he? This is the thing. He's just taking his time. 
He's got four and a half minutes, but we're also hearing there's a lot of action in another game. And while we wait for a move here, should, should we pop over there? Let's definitely pop over there because that position looks like it is a one-way traffic for Fabiano Caruana. I mean, look at that. Pawn on F3, pawn on E4. All yeah. Fabiano needs to do is uh, magically transport a queen to G3 or get the E pawn rolling, as Simon has indicated, and Bob's your uncle. He's into the quarterfinals. That's right. Yeah, it looks very good for Fabi. His position was great before. They're both a little bit of shorter time. White's only hope is that he can maybe use the D pawn and then, then get some attack against Black King. Black's lost a bit of protection. So if this White Queen can swing over at all, you might be able to start a counterattack. So D6 is, is a little threat, I feel here, Yvanka, to try and get it over. Do you actually have a, an uncle called Bob, by the way? I do. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I, I, I have a first name called Yvanka. <laughs> I don't have it. <laughs> I was going to say, sorry, yeah, Bob. that was a silly question. <laughs> Bob Yvanka Husker. <laughs> I don't know. Kind of, you know It'd be a bit weird, wouldn't it? Um, Oh, by the way, uh, also Prague has played a move, but we'll catch up with Prague a little bit later. Let's just see what Fabiano is going to do here. Okay, so he stops that idea. Now the D-pawn can't move. A very nice idea um, because you're pinning the pawn down to the queen. So that stops that. And E3 is, is, is a major threat uh, on, uh, on the position. Um, so I think... Fabiano is going to win this. White comes over to try and control that square. Fabiano looking very composed here. Duda obviously looking a lot more concerned, realising that this could be the end of his World Cup. He's won this last time around. Fantastic yeah. player. Does really well um, in these events. But how do you win this, Black? Do we try to get the Queen in now? I I like that yeah, idea. I was thinking was queen f7, queen f4. That was kind of what appealed to me. I also looked at queen d8 as well. Queen I mean, D8. one thing that you should not necessarily be tempted by uh, moves like rook takes pawn. Are there you can? Rook takes pawn is a possibility. Can you be so greedy? I suppose, that, you know, simple is best if it works, right? So I, I guess Fabi is just calculating if he can grab this pawn. You know, get rid of and he I grabs think he it. Has, I think he has just taken it. Yeah, if it works, why not? Why not just grab the pawn? I, and a reason that I, I guess the reason he was thinking about this is because e4 is a little bit weak when it gets attacked, but I, I think he can always defend it in the right way. Well, he has to counter queen c2. He has to have a good answer there. Yeah, queen c2, pinning that one down looks like a, a much better square than the squares I was thinking of. And what would you play against this move? That's a, that's a good try. And we see Easy Duda. Too. Don't underestimate Duda, though. I mean, his online name is a Polish fighter, and it's there for a reason. Queen C2 happened, but of course, Fabiano, he's worked it out, and he responds instantly with Queen B5 check. Where does the king go? Let's say it goes to F2. What, what would be his idea then? I mean, you can swap the queens off, but I, I don't know if that's the idea. He has moved his king. He's moved it to f2, the most logical square. And now some nice little checks being shown here. This is nice play from Fabi. Where would a king go? If the king comes up, it's going to be exposed. So it has to come backwards. It does go backwards. So the queen has improved its positioning. They'll need to finish this off, though. Can't make mistakes here. No, and uh, the question is, though, what, what is, what is the next move? It might be and... rook d four, and I've got an idea. Rook d four, rook takes here, queen g six, maybe G6. is that? Yeah. So let's just show that. So you go rook d four, and if I go rook takes e four, it looks like suddenly white is doing okay, but there's then this counter it's... in. I'm it's on the board, Simon. Huh? It's on the board. It's rook d4 it. played. Rook d4. Yeah. And this was the very clever line that Fabi has worked out because, of course, if you don't lose this pawn, you 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 are you're, you're winning quite easily. 
because they will just queen at some point. And that's a that's a horrible, horrible use of the double pin there. The rook comes up and you pin it down. Yeah, and uh, three more moves until the time control where Duda and Fabiana Carona will be given a 30-minute bonus time. But it's looking unlikely that Duda will even get to that stage. His position, if Fabiana <laughs> Carona holds on to the e-pawn, will just be in tatters. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like Fabi. He looks really cool as well. Composed. He's not going to throw this one away. He's got enough time. Three minutes on the clock. And how does Black win this position? Well, you know, you can use these checks again. Maybe just centralize your queen. But you're never going to lose the pawn. And once you're centralized, you can slowly prepare the move E3 by getting your king to a safer square. It's not going to be maybe one immediately. Duda is a big fighter. Duda will fight on until the end. But it's, if you can't... Simon. Yeah. I was just going to say, like, if you can't take that pawn, yeah. then Queen H6 is coming your way. Queen H6 as well. Horrible idea. That is, yeah, just come. Oh, wow. Nice, nice use of the, the whole board there, Ivanka, coming coming in to attack the White King on H3. Very nice. Very nice find. Yeah, yeah. and Duda now ticking to under four minutes. He is desperately thinking about how he can stay alive. Because if he loses this game, that is it. He will be out of the competition. And Fabiano looking away. It's, I think it, Fabiano has reached that moment where he knows yeah. it's in the bag. I think he's, he looking, he's looking like, who am I going to play next? Come on, Duda, I, I've got this one. And, um, well, I mean, the, the biggest mistake I find you can actually do in a big chess match like this, Yvanka, is you know, count your chickens before they hatch, right? You relax a little bit too early. And whenever I've done this, whenever I think, yeah, my game's winning, you know, I'm go, I'm going to, you know, have a nice win here. That's when I start making mistakes and I don't convert those promising positions. It's really important to only relax when you've shaken hands. You know, do not relax until you've sh your opponent has resigned. It's like, you know, You'll just go a little bit easy because when your opponent's got the back against the wall, they're going to fight harder as well. They're going to find more tricks. You've got to be aware of these tricks. Yeah. Well, I'm desperately playing, trying. Yeah. I'm desperately trying to see one trick that Duda has in the position, and I cannot see anything. And if, he makes a, if he makes a passive move like Queen F2, well, that's just passive. And, of course, Fabiano still has those monster pawns e4 and f3 you cannot fight those pawns yeah they're too strong i mean they're not just two connected past pawns but they're the connected past pawns very close to queening and prague still seems to be winning in this game just so you can keep an eye on that maybe this is what fabi is looking at i mean we could even go there maybe the prague game because i duda i think he realizes if he can't take the pawn yeah. it's just game over let's go to prague we have some moves there i think we need to try and catch what is probably the end of that game in this time trouble so let's see we are we had loads of moves here what has happened in the prag game so going back we had f5 being played this is the last time we looked at it now prag played b5 just attacking the rook the rook retreated and now wow Knight takes d5 here, double exclamation mark from Prague. What a move. We've shown how strong this move can be with the queen coming in. Let's get up to date with the position. The only chance really Black has here is to try and get the queens off. So he does. But the problem with this is that now you've put the black rook in a very bad square. So knight b6 picks up the rook. The king moves. Knight takes c8, and it even here requires very careful calculation because it looks like black is going to get some material back. But rook a6 played, allowing black to get material back, and he simply takes on e6. He's so cool to play these moves, right? Because even here, I wouldn't be 100% confident I'm winning. I'd be like, it's equal material. It is. But Prague has worked out 
that this pawn is going to be too strong and his rook is going to start doing the hoover and start picking up pawns. So interesting way to convert the advantage, I think, but it looks beautiful. Yeah, really very, beautiful. I don't know, beautiful. really great, classy stuff here. You can see uh, Burke is trying to activate the king, but there's so many pawns up for grabs. And it's actually not the pawns that uh, I, I would probably go for if I white. I would be just tempted to push those uh, past pawns, the D pawn and the E pawn, just get the rook out of his own way and start marching them forward. Yeah, I mean, you, you could even like pin the bishop down. Rookie eight is a standard idea in this kind of position. So you maybe even threaten a, a well-timed bishop a3 using the pin on uh, on those pieces. Um, so yeah, rookie eight, very tempting. There's many tempting moves here, but you know, I, th I think even to play in this manner though, I mean, there are other options that Prague could have done, just shows real confidence. And I think it's he has he has grabbed the pawn. I mean, that can't be a bad move. But it shows, like, I think how players have advanced in recent times. You know, Prague, um, really confident in his abilities, but also in his calculation, which you get from working with computers a lot. Any chances <laughs> at all for Black here? I want to say yes, but I, I realistically don't see anything. No. And, I, I mean, White's plan is so simple. You, you can take your time. You can rush with it. Okay, so he's gone C3. I would be tempted to go Rook C6. Just get behind the pawn. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're, you're and then the more aren't you, the merrier. You, you know, you like, yeah. you like winning and not giving your opponent any fun whatsoever. You know, it's a bit, a bit harsh. Can't you give him a glimmer of hope? No. You know? you, no. Chess no. is uh, it's a street them. fight. I mean, I love that quote. I can't remember who said it, but it's like chess is a street fight. When your opponent's down on the ground, you kick him. <laughs> yeah. Don't give them any chances. And I, I do like rook c6. I mean, it, it just tries to win that pawn. If you can win that pawn, that's black's last hope. And with rook c6, well, black can fight on bishop b4, but then your pawn's are going to come through and these two pawns are at the right time i think the way you just safely win this he's played it he, he he's he's sadistic as well he gets his rook behind black must save this pawn and the way now that white is covering that pawn it's not really a danger i think you've got to push you've got to maybe watch out for this one any last tricks you've got to watch out for that's the only trick i see and okay so this one looks like it's completely winning yeah. d5 yeah, sure. is coming shall we turn our attention to the fabiano caruana game or should we stick with 100%. this one i think fabiano this one i think we can write off as a win for prague um Pra unless something remarkable happens i mean to be honest the fabiano game was looking that way as well but oh okay we have some developments we could be getting a result any second here i will show where we were moving into it rook d4 white went passive here but it didn't work very well fabiano centralizing his queen and now he comes in for the final attack current position on the board yeah and uh duda threatening queen takes pawn check that's about the only thing <laughs> but of course that is going to be easily fended off he can play rook takes rook he can go into the queen and queen and pawn ending he can in fact just uh step the queen forward and defend the pawn i think there's a really nice way to force it as well i mean if, if you oh, can he has played it he has this, queen d3 this is a lovely move because the point is, if, if Duda now takes the queen, you flick in a rook takes rook check. So we can show that on the board here. If you go queen takes queen, okay. I mean, any move except for rook takes rook is okay for Duda, but you go rook takes rook first. And this is quite an amusing situation where the king, if it goes one way, pawn pushes the other way, and you can't stop it because both of the squares are covered. If the king goes that way, 
same thing happens with the other pawns. So what that actually means is that um, the Black King will just eventually march down and, and support. Simon, we are gonna we are on the verge of seeing Nduda resign. You could, he looked at the clock. He stepped forward yeah. with his king. He knows it is over. The body language is pretty clear there, isn't it? Yeah. yeah he's not looking at the board anymore. The white king is now also probably in a mating net. The king. If he steps to g1, there will come f2. So that's why he steps the king forward. But you kind of called it, Simon. The king cannot survive in the open for too long. I'm guessing Fabiano Caruana can give a check with a rook, can also step back with the queen to d6. Fabi. Maybe even f2 That's is too good. Yeah. Just play this one because uh, there's coordination between these two guys. And um, if you can distract the defender of the queen away, which is the rook, then you just win immediately with f2. And also, the queen is pinned. So f2, I mean, I think all those moves you mentioned win. <laughs> Everything wins here. <laughs> but you know, F2 rook, kills rook. it. F2 is just the killer, yeah. Use that pawn. And I think he's about to play it. And I think yeah. this will be resigned. Yeah, he's reaching he for it. it. F2 it. On, yeah. the on the board. And handshake from Duda. And Fabiano progresses to the quarterfinals. Really nice play from Fabiano there with the black pieces, taking down one of the favourites, taking down Duda.